On today's episode of Mile Higher, we have a guest here, Jennifer Koffendaufer, retired FBI agent. One of the things I always learned about was just how hard it is to just get into the academy. The Bureau makes cases because of informants. If you didn't have an informant, you were judged very poorly. What do you think are some of the biggest issues with local law enforcement? There are some people, I call them the 10 percenters, and they get in because they want to be in power. I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, you could trace a lot of the issues of local departments to funding. Do you think it's possible he has committed other murders potentially? I think only Brian Koberger can tell us. I think his DNA would have matched to other killings. You know, you had an incident where you were attacked in college and was that part of, you know, you wanting to get into this field? I'm never going to be a victim like that again mm -hmm. and I want to put bad guys in jail. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 272. And today we are really excited because we have a guest here, Jennifer Koffendaufer, retired FBI agent and very active person in the true crime world. I know you do tons of appearances on many different shows. You've come on my show before. You know, you're a frequent contributor to News Nation, and we are so excited to have you here today. Uh, I am so excited to be here. I mean, not only is it gorgeous in Denver this time of year, it is, <laughs> but I, you guys have just been so gracious and this is just, it's great. I'm with my people talking true crime. <laughs> I know we've been, we've been just chatting for hours here. I'm like, okay, we actually got to get started. <laughs> yeah. We probably had like two podcast episodes recorded yeah. or not recorded mm -hmm. prior to this starting. So, mm -hmm. so much to talk about. I mean, it's not so every day much. that we get access to somebody who's been in law enforcement for as long as you have was nearly 30 years of law enforcement experience so we're i'm excited to dive into to all of that and and beyond so like josh said we have so many things that we want to get into here today but i'd like to start out just introducing you to our audience and telling your story and your experience which i think could be a full episode in itself but we have other questions to get to regarding a few other cases as well but can you start out by telling us a little bit about your upbringing and you know your life before the FBI and then how you got inspired to to pursue a career in law enforcement. Right. So uh, I guess my beginning is kind of unusual. Uh, I was adopted as an infant. Uh, I was raised by nuns for the first uh, about three months of my life. I wow. was adopted in January. I was born in October. And... Um, so anyway, um, I was adopted uh, by the Browns, um, but I was born uh, Cassandra Blanquez Aponte. Oh, that's so beautiful. I'm, um, I actually found my biological parents when I was 27 years old, Wow! which meant a lot to me. Um, at the time, I was an FBI agent. I felt like I was pretty well established. I'd already graduated from college. I had a career, and I felt like it was really time to figure out um, sort of my bloodlines of where I came from. And so uh, I took off work and actually with a lot of help from some of my FBI colleagues that I think really um, uh, were sympathetic, if you will, empathetic to my situation helped me mm -hmm. uh, because my quest took me international. I ended up finding my father in Puerto Rico. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, it was funny because... Um, once we got the number, I called where he worked and he worked for a city. And I was thinking, okay, maybe he works for the trash department or maybe police since I was, you know, police fire. I didn't know. And I called and uh, his secretary, uh, because I guess everybody, well, not I guess, I came to find out he had always talked about the child, you know, that oh, wow. he knew he had. Yeah. And um, he was the mayor of oh, the city wow and uh actually was secretary of sports and secretary of boxing and cockfighting and everything <laughs> else so he's a he's a great guy um we're very very close and then i found my mother too uh who was in texas um so uh, she had a phd in um education and was of mexican descent and american indian mascalera apache so that's why I look kind of dark. And uh, 
So it was great to find my true roots and uh, all of that. And the family that raised me, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, there was a divorce very early when I was very young. Just a lot of, uh, I think, background that has helped me, you know, be a better person and more difficult circumstances. Um, Mm -hmm. I left home uh, my senior year in high school. Oh, wow. And uh, I put an ad in the paper. And uh, a wonderful woman named Marcille, who actually just passed very recently, answered that ad. And for $75, I got room and board and was able to finish out my high school um, days and then start college and just, um, you know, had a great, you know, college experience and was very blessed uh, to have an opportunity to be an intern uh, for the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Agriculture. Okay. And um, that's a federal authority. It's a 1811. It's exactly, believe it or not, the same as ATF and U.S. Marshals. I trained at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe. Wow. And I trained with the, everybody in my class was ATF, UF, U.S. Marshals. Um, and then there was me, the little ag agent, they call us. But great, interesting crime. You know, people don't really understand what ag agents do. It's amazing. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, Out in a field for days and nights, I shouldn't say days because in the days we were sleeping in a camper, but at night we had our night vision goggles and we're laying down on the ground watching rendering a rendering plant. Like people go pick up cancer eye dead cattle, take them and then slaughter them and put them into, you know, for people to consume. Whoa. Um, so it was just some cases were really, really cool like that. Another really interesting case I worked when I was with agriculture um, was food stamp fraud. Now that might sound boring, but this was anything but boring. This was taking uh, food stamps and going into storefronts uh, that were actually selling drugs. And oh, so wow. I would walk in there undercover and give them $50 in food stamps well, usually it was a hundred, whatever you got half back in cash. So say I gave them a hundred, I'd get $50 back in cash and then would go out back and buy crack cocaine with Whoa. it. So all these places exist that really, um, really it's terrible because the people who really need this, these food stamps and things to supply food for their children and their families, but are hooked on drugs. These are storefronts that supply that. And I did that right here in Denver. Wow, how interesting. Yeah, it was really it was really great. Um so I loved working for them. Um but then I thought I think I'm going to go to law school. And so I really kind of started down that path, take my LSAT and all of that. And then um I decided, well, you know what? I should look into the FBI. And I was very intimidated by the bureau. I'm about 5 foot tall and 110 pounds at that time. I may be a little bit more right now. And um, anyway, I was just intimidated because it was many, many years ago. um, And there weren't very many women in the FBI. And I'll never forget, I walked across the street to the FBI building right here in Denver. And um, I went in and started taking a bunch of tests and was interviewed. And the next thing you knew, I, um, within seven months, I was in the at the FBI Academy. In Quantico, right? In Quantico. Yeah. You know, the FBI Academy, it's, it really probably doesn't exist like it existed when I was there uh, in terms of the physical stuff, like the Yellow Brick Road and all the obstacle courses because mm-hmm. people have gotten hurt since then and they've, you know, dumbed it down a little bit and everything that was required. What's the Yellow Brick Road? Oh, the Yellow Brick Road was so cool. You... You, you know, if you want to see the Yellow Brick Road, watch Silence of the Lambs. Mm, I thought that's where I've seen it before. The Silence of the Lambs is the most true-to-life situation of any movie I've watched, except you would never have a trainee, yeah. you know, solving the crime, doing anything, right. leaving the academy. But the mistakes that are made in that case, you, I, I don't know if you remember that case or in that movie, but um, all those individuals there, they aren't actors in actresses those are fbi agents when she gets tapped on the shoulder and said 
you know, come, you've got to call Agent Starling. That was Mr. Bonnie, who was my physical fitness instructor. Oh, wow. And like handed her creds. That was Mr. Stowe who handed me my creds because that show was filmed right before I got there. And in fact, there was a guy from my class in there. So we ended up take, going to see kind of the intro of that movie, um, a group of us from class. It was great. Yeah. So anyway, the Academy was great. Um, you learned so much. Hell Week was horrible, you know, which is where you have your white collar crime test, your um, uh, your physical fitness battery test, which is always difficult for everybody, uh, your shooting test. And if you fail any of those, you're recycled back. Um, we had three people recycled within the first So I mean you week. start from the beginning or you're just completely out? They take you and they work with you to try to fix. So they don't just kick you to the curb. They'll try to right. get you up to speed if they can. They try to, but I will say we had three people kicked out of our class and they never came back. Oh, wow. So wow. Um, only three though. Yeah. That's not too bad. There were no. 30 of us. Okay. There were four yeah. girls. Which how many... So... So I'm, I may have mentioned this on the show. Like when I was a kid, I was obsessed with the FBI. I wanted to be an FBI agent. And so like one of the things I always learned about was just how hard it is to just get into the academy and be chosen and, and how extensive the background checks are. Like, did they really go and like talk to your like grade school teachers, like go all the way back and, and interview everybody from your past and, and all that? It's such a good question. Yes, all the way back. And it was really wow. interesting because when I retired, I got to see my full Did you personnel really? file, yeah. every single thing in there. I got to see what my high school teachers said, wow. what people who knew me back then said. Whoa. And it was so interesting because you never get to see that as an agent. And oh, it was so great. It, it was really interesting to see what everybody said. But yeah, that is how thorough they are. They go all the way back and they just want to make sure nothing bites them in yeah. the bud. And how I always tell people, it's like a barrel. So just consider a barrel of names and what can make you rise to the top mm -hmm. where you even get a look-see. And some of those things are like having a pilot's license. Um, some of those things are having um, the ability to speak another language, particularly like Spanish, Arabic, mm -hmm. uh, Mandarin. Uh, the, there's certain things that can make you um, sort of be at the top of the barrel. Um, I was very fortunate because I was already a special agent, 1811, same classification with the Office of Inspector General. And I came in right when the crash of the savings and loans happened. Oh, wow. If you can remember clear back then, but it was like in the late 80s. Um, the SNL industry completely crashed. And so uh, there was legislation called FIREA that was designated to try to expose fraud within our banking system because everybody was concerned that our banks were going to crash. And so under that legislation, they could hire individuals with expertise in financial crimes. And the biggest crimes I worked when I was with the Department of Agriculture, I talked to you about two of the fun ones, but really, and I think this was fun, <laughs> One of the biggest ones I worked was, uh, they were called payment limitation cases, and I worked two of them. And these cases involved huge landowners in Nebraska and in uh, Colorado that had tens of thousands of acres. And to get subsidies, which was 200000 you could only get that if you were a landowner one time. Well, what they would do is they call it Min Mississippi Christmas tree it, because it happened <laughs> down there too. And they would get friends, family, kids, oh, wow. relatives to supposedly have a farm that was 100 acres or 200 acres. Oh, wow. So you had all of these individuals getting $200,000 subsidies, only really it was going to the same landowner. So it was a huge uh, fraud. Yeah, that is. Wow. Huge fraud. And that was my, uh, that's mainly what I worked. At, 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 they were so nice to you know, entrust that case, those two cases, the Lucan case and the Bond case with me. And that's what I spent so much time on. And that, that gave me the experience to be hired then really by the FBI under the FIREA program. Wow. That's, I can't even, I had no idea that that type of, you know, the, the, fraud uh, yeah. goes on. 
within, but it makes sense. There is a way to defraud. Somebody's figured out how to do it. And the government subsidies in every, uh, you know, venue is just so extreme and particularly in agriculture. So, and I grew up on a farm. The Browns lived on a dairy farm. That's where I grew up. Oh, interesting. So do you think so, that played into you going into the inspector general's office or? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, I was at the University of Kansas when they came and interviewed for an internship. Uh-huh. And I applied to that internship on campus and they hired me, which really would get, so I worked for them as an intern. And then right when my internship in, in, or ended, they immediately hired me as a full-time special agent. And um, so it was, that worked out really been, well then. Yeah. It worked out great. And it was in the area that I knew, yeah. you know, farming um, background. Yeah. And how old were you when you were working those cases? Oh my God, I was so young. I graduated from college at 22. Wow. So I went through the federal law enforcement training center at 22. Wow. wow. And I was a gun toting special <laughs> agent at 20. Two, <laughs> no, was, I think I went in August, my birthday, 22, maybe the beginning of 23, probably 22 years old. The end of wow, that is so impressive. I mean, just yeah. some of the conversations we've had about what you've experienced as a woman and to see you as a, a truly self-made person, it's, it's very inspiring. Today's episode is brought to you by Higher Love Wellness. I'm sure many of you know and maybe have shopped at Higher Love Wellness before. That is Kendall and I's CBD wellness company. We put a lot of love into it, hence the name. But if you haven't shopped Higher Love Wellness, we have a lot of different products in the CBD category. We have everything from heart-shaped CBD gummies, which are absolutely delicious. We even have a nighttime blend to help you fall asleep. We also have CBD topicals, which are great for pain, inflammation, along with CBD concentrates. So if you're into vaping and all that good stuff, we've got that as well as pet products, which we're very proud of. We have some amazing CBD pet shoes, which are just great for helping your pets mellow out, helps them sleep and helps with pain. Maybe you're dog is suffering from arthritis this is all really good as a daily supplement and also right now we are running a sale on all of our cbd oils our tinctures which are really great to take just directly on the tongue or you can put them in your favorite drink or smoothie and they come in a bunch of different flavors blueberry og pineapple express watermelon haze we're super proud of our products and their quality they're extremely potent they really do work we use them every single day and you should too check out higherlovewellness.com we ship to all 50 states we'd love if you'd support higherlovewellness.com there was an event when you were in college. I don't know if you're comfortable talking about it, but we had heard that, you know, you had an incident where you were attacked in college. And was that part of, you know, you wanting to get into this field? A hundred percent. You know, when you initially, when I was in college, I was uh, my father, um, Vic Brown, who passed two years ago, Farmer Brown. Um, he, uh, was a computer science, that was his background, okay. engineer type of guy, besides being a dairy farmer. And um, I really thought I'd follow in his footsteps. You know, I really would. Um, so when I first got into college, you know, back when I went to go live with Marseille and everything um, at Wichita State, which is a big engineering school, um, that was my major, computer science. And then uh, unfortunately, um, my freshman year, uh, I was um, going to study with a girlfriend of mine, uh, Spanish, mm-hmm. and uh, I was in a sorority, and I drove across a uh, camp. It's not very far. My God, my heart is beating. Why does my heart beat so much with this story? It's funny it's because I never, um, something that, and I know people who are survivors and who have experienced trauma, they totally relate. You know, when you go through something like this, you, um, obviously I talked about it at the time yeah. to a degree. I mean, our whole campus was put on um, alert. You know, the police came to all our sorority houses. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was in the news because there were 12 individuals, um, you know, attacked. Um but essentially, I was going to um, um, 
just go study with her at an apartment. And as I uh, got out of my car, I heard footsteps behind me. It was freezing night in Kansas. I was in a dress. I'll never forget it. And I, um, I heard those footsteps. I looked behind me and I, I knew I was in a lot of trouble. Like right when I met that person's eyes and I dropped my books and I ran toward the entrance. And this is an apartment complex where there are three stories, right? And you open the foyer and, and so you're inside at that point. Well, he caught me right when I opened that door, had me in a headlock and he threw me to the ground and um, began to try to rape me, you know, which is an involved wow. process. Yeah. Um, I was screaming. You know, I had no self-defense training at that point. I, you know, I, there's a fight, flight, or fright that everybody, you know, comes to. For me, I, I know I'm a runner naturally. Yeah, I really wasn't trying to fight like to hurt him or anything. I just wanted to get away, I think. And so I think I was struggling from that standpoint. But he hit me pretty good. Um, in any event, um, I think because I was screaming, the police were called. And we could hear the sirens. And... um as we heard those sirens, he decided it would be a better idea to take me out of that uh, foyer area. And there was a car waiting with his buddy. Um, and so he began dragging me and it, it's like one of those, I hate to call it a cartoon, but you know how you see somebody grabbing onto the railing Yeah, and yeah. he's like pulling me. That's what it looked like. Yeah. And, um, so thankfully, um, I think as, we could hear sirens nearing. Um, he made a decision whether he was going to get away or going to get away with me. And I wasn't letting go. So he let go of me and jumped in the car and got out of there before the police got there. And I was just spared. I mean, I'm just so grateful because he raped somebody um, just very close by there within the next wow. few hours. Yeah. They never caught him. I'm 100% convinced that he, I believe there were 12 total victims and I'm 100% convinced he moved on or was later arrested for something else or for a crime similar and spent his years in prison because people don't just stop that. Mm -hmm. No. But I think it, it really, it changed my life. Of course. It made me, my whole trajectory went from criminal justice, or uh, sorry, from computer, computer science, science to criminal justice. Wow. And I'm so glad in a way that it happened. Um, but I wish I could have got this road a different way. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's really inspiring for people to hear though, that, you know, you have taken things into your own hands and, and worked through that trauma and built a career where, you know, you catch these people and have worked on so many cases where, you know, it could have prevented someone from doing something to someone else. And, that's that's an amazing driving force, I'm sure, for you. It was the whole sp inspiration. Um, you never want to ever, I mean, there was a point where you're kind of like broken, a, a little course. bit broken because you're so scared to even, and that's why on the Dylan Mortensen, if I can divert, you know, I really, really feel for her. Uh, yes. I and I know too. she wasn't touched. I know that she was, it wasn't an attempted rape. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. She saw that figure she feared for her life and people who have not walked that walk and i've never walked dylan's walk but unless you've been in her shoes how can you dare say you would have done this Judge you would have done that yeah mm -hmm. and so that that's why i think you know i'm a very strong advocate for victims and, yes and victims who survive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you're not familiar um that DM, the roommate, I've always referred to her as a DM because I haven't covered the case since the very early days, but from the Idaho murders, um, the Brian Koberger case, which we will get into later. Um, but yeah, there, there is a lot to be said with that because she has, there are some pretty brutal people out there when it comes to her situation who just can't ever imagine being in something like that. And it's interesting that these people have these opinions and are so... I would do this. It's like, yeah, you truly can't imagine what that would be like. 
either take it in a place. I mean, I certainly, it took me a while, but you, for me, I definitely took it to that place where I'm never going to be, um, you know, a victim like that again. Mm -hmm. And I want to put bad guys in jail. And self-defense has become really important to you, I know, and and teaching other women how to protect themselves. Is there any tips that you can give our audience for how to be more vigilant, how to protect yourself as a woman out in the world or a man out in the world too? You know, it's a dangerous place. It is. It's dangerous for both. And uh, a couple of tips. One is just the awareness. I always talk about, and this is something we learned in the Bureau, being in a white space, uh, yellow space, orange space, red space, what space are you in? So red is you're in the fight. You know, you've been assaulted, you're in the fight. Um, White is you're relaxing on a beach in the Bahamas, uh, sipping on a Mai Tai, Mm -hmm. you feel very safe or at home, you know, um, under alarm, right? So I think it's very important to be in yellow. Yellow all the time, at least when you're out and about. And that's like when you're driving a car, you're aware of what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself will take your uh, possibilities of getting hurt from way up here to way down here. And that's what it's all about is really reducing uh, the percentages of making you a person that could be attacked. And I've heard you speak about safety, specifically in parking garages, because that type of thing happens all the time. What are the tips that you would have for people who are walking alone at night or, you know, whether that's a parking garage or somewhere else, how can you be more vigilant and prepared for an attack? Well, the number one thing is not to have your cell phone in your hand, not to have your earbuds in. I know this sounds just cliche, but it's so important to have so your true. senses about you. Mm-hmm. Also, and I tell my daughter this and she does this and I do this. Why haven't I been attacked since I was attacked? Because I'm vigilant. I have my pepper spray in my hand. I have my finger. I understand how it works. It, a lot of people buy pepper spray. They come to my classes and I say, how many of you have pepper spray? And you know, three or four raise their hand. And I say, how many of you have ever practiced with your pepper spray? Nobody. (laughs) No one. Mm -hmm. And because some of them are twist top, some of them have a a latch. Uh, And so the last thing you want to do is go to spray somebody and you're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Or you spray it towards yourself on accident yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And and just the effects of pepper are brutal. Mm-hmm. The pepper spray itself. Have and, you been pepper sprayed? Oh, in the bureau. <laughs> in training, yeah. Yeah. Every time you, so as a firearms instructor, uh, SWAT, um, you had to become OC spray proficient. They take you and literally spray it, make your whole face orange. Oh, wow. And then you have to be able to react. Right. You know, like draw a weapon. How do you do fight. that? I've I don't seen know. those videos. I, I, this I blows my mind. I have always said that was the one point that I thought, this is so wrong on so many levels. Like, can't we figure out a better way to see if people can yeah. survive <laughs> the pepper spray experience? Yeah. Um, when I was at Glencoe, you know, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. No, no, no. Actually, that was, yeah, at Glencoe, they put us in a warehouse with CS and CN in the ambient air. In the gas, yeah, the air. And then you had to stay there. At Quantico, they not only pepper sprayed you, they pepper sprayed you on a bus full of CS and CN. Whoa. And it was funny. So my my buddies and I, whenever you're in class, I, I mean, it just happens. You have a little group that you're closer with, you know, than the other group. And- we had our group. I mean, we just had a reunion actually at my house. Everybody flew in to Florida and it's just so awesome. The camaraderie. I always say, oh, yeah, I mean, those guys really are cool. my pallbearers. I mean, they're, they're just uh, such great guys. But anyway, um, we thought we were tough. We were young. I mean, I was, when I went to the FBI, I was 25. Wow. That's Only so 25. young. Yeah. That's amazing. And my, one of the guys in our group Steve Gomez, I believe, was only 24. <laughs> and so we thought we were pretty, because most of the guys were 30. Sure. I think the average age to get in the bureau was 33 at the time. So, you know, we were youngins. So we thought we're tough. We're going to go to the back of the bus. We can hang on the CSCN bus forever. So the instructors said, hey, all of you guys at the back, I'm putting you at the front. 
And all you guys that wanted to get off the bus early, you moved to the back. I was so happy <laughs> that he moved us to the front. It was horrible. Um, so anyway, that's my pepper spray experience. But I do recommend people spray it and so you know what it feels like because you're not going to be able to see because mm-hmm. your eyes are going to fill with the water and the spray. You're not going to be able to breathe. When you spray it outward? Uh, yeah, because what happens is even if you're not downwind, so to speak, it fills that air all around and you're going to be coughing, you're going to be hacking, it's going to fill your lungs and you have to know you can survive even when you're in those situations. You're blowing Ray. her mind right now. Yeah, <laughs> I want just, you to go buy one. All right, we no, have we a bunch have of it. it. I've always had pepper spray and I've never practiced it. All right, you're going to spray it. me when we get home. <laughs> no, right. whatever you do, don't do it inside. <laughs> my very first class, my self-defense class, it was at kind of a warehouse setting. Yeah. All these people in there. And we got to this part and I was explaining the importance of practicing with it. Mm-hmm. I went to the corner. This is a big warehouse. And I squirted like this. The whole thing, everyone's hacking and coughing. Whoa. I'm like, oh, big mistake. It was my first class. Never did it again. So now I tell everybody, go outside. Don't be downwind. You'll get enough of the flavor of how it affects you. Maybe we'll have to have a little company-wide practice session because we just bought our whole team pepper spray. Oh, good. And yeah, I we... didn't even think we should probably practice and yeah. test it out. But Only yeah. squirt one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, and I've always, since college, I've had a taser too. And I've never, it's I don't a, really know how to use it. Like I've pressed the button and I've just seen it. But gun. like, the, it's yeah, not no, real. it's not a real, t- you know, it's a stun gun. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I've never really, I, my self-defense skills, I definitely need to, to work on further because I have the tools, but I've never really practiced them. And that's such a good point. I think many people need to hear that. And it's, I also like that you brought up the phone thing. I was told that in college too. We had I was in a sorority as well, and we had a police officer come and and talk to us about campus safety and, um, you know, not being on your phone. That always really stuck with me, especially when I'm by myself. It's one thing if he's there and he's looking out. I'll you know look at my phone, but mm-hmm. it's so important. That's how they target people is the people that aren't paying attention, who aren't vigilant. They're they're yeah. the easiest targets. And I think that's such a valuable thing to remind people, especially in today's day and age where everyone's glued to their phone. Yeah. It's like, it's just second nature. Walking you don't even the street, think about it. Yeah, just yeah. or like, yeah. And sometimes when you're in public spaces and you don't want to make interaction with anybody and look around because that's just how people are nowadays, that everyone's glued down. And that's, that's what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. One other tip. I don't know if this is, I'm curious what you think of this, but I remember this officer told me to walk with my car keys through my middle finger like this and kind of like point them and hold them. To, <laughs> I don't, I've never thought it was very valuable, but it stayed with me and I always do it when I'm by myself now. I have so many people ask me about that to come to my class. You probably, did I wrinkle my nose? They say my face just gives me away <laughs> no matter what, like happy, yeah. sad. I already knew I what can your tell answer you were like, nah, that's that. not. So. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is when you're in the fight, yeah, that isn't what you're probably going to drop your keys. Yeah. Like you're going to try to run. And, um, but there are some really good um, self-defense moves that you can do. If somebody gets in, you know, you're in the grasp, I'm just going to tell you, they're going to get you from behind most likely and uh, maybe possibly rush you and tackle you down. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's probably never going to come into play. It, what really comes to play though is that I would agree with is establishing an offense. And that's usually using three premises, speed, uh, surprise, and violence of action. So in other words, when you decide to make a move, if you're laying there and they have you on the ground, that means like a quick move to headbutt, as an example, or a quick move to um, strike the growing area. Um, So when I teach the class, we do um, hand-to-hand combat. The first half, the first hour is strictly about how not to be a victim. And what we do is we analyze victims of uh, rapists and serial killers, and we look at what they did wrong. So we use their hindsight. That's the first part of the class. So it's not a normal self-defense class. The second half, we go hand to hand. I mean, there's strangling, there's ligatures, there's surprise attacks, Hmm. because you want to have that happen in a self-defense class as opposed to your first time. In real life, yeah. In real life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's such a such a valuable thing to learn that I'm sure 
so many people would love to and just like haven't taken the time yet. I know that's something that I really, I want to find the time to do for myself. And especially now having a daughter, I'd like for her to to be prepared for that kind of thing one day too. You know what? Next time I come here, we should do your crew. Yeah, we yeah, should. We should. Last awesome. time I was here, I taught a self-defense class in, in Morrison. Oh, really? Yeah, Morrison, Colorado. I love Morrison. It's just right up yeah. the way, as you guys know. Red yeah, Rocks. Red Rocks, yeah. And it, it's funny because one of the things I do is no matter where I teach, because I teach all over the country, I first analyze what your crime situation is. And, you know, you go into venues like New York and the crime's bad, even St. Augustine, Florida, you know, different places I've taught, Montana, and there's, you know, crime. And so I show where you fit in terms of percentages of people getting attacked. The zero percent, like the best place to live in the entire country, at least when I taught this a year and a half ago, was Morrison. Really? I had always wondered, where is, it's, <laughs> it's called 100 on the scale. In other words, you're 100% safer than any place. It's Morrison, Colorado. Oh, that's good to know. That doesn't that, really surprise me at wasn't all. Wasn't that pretty cool? Yeah, yeah, that is really cool. So I'm like, you really don't need my class. Class dismissed. Yeah, no, I said you might here? go to Denver, so you <laughs> yeah. better still take the class because yeah, no. Denver's not good. Uh, no, it's not. It's getting it's getting pretty dangerous here. That would be fantastic, though. And maybe we could do some type of collaboration where we we create like a video, an educational video or something. That would be really yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 I think great. it's it's skills that people really need to know. And yeah. you don't think about it until you're in that situation or, you know, someone who is and then, you know, you would take that action. But I love the self-defense talk. Don't don't get me wrong. I do want to hear more yes, about the I FBI know. days. Yes. OK. Pretty much everything these days is ultra expensive and with rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all time high, now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, then this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into a one low 0% interest monthly payment. When I got out of college, I actually took advantage of a similar program to PDS Debt. I had a number of different credit cards I had racked up thousands of dollars in and I was really struggling to pay them off. And it really does help to roll all of those payments into one low monthly payment. And best of all, 0% interest when you're making those payments. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required, which is amazing. Bad and fair credit is accepted. Save thousands of dollars in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. Nothing feels better than to get out of debt and PDS Debt is here to help you get to that place. PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash mh. That's p-d-s-d-e-b-t dot com slash mh. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash mh. So kind of circling back to where we were just, and you know, we can be more brief on the FBI stuff, but I just wanted to know, like, once you got out of the academy, what was, you know, what was kind of, where'd you go from there? And, and maybe just talk about some of your, your favorite um, investigations and different things that you did. Well, I, I was really lucky. How it works is at week eight, uh, when I went through, uh, you find out where you're going to go. Right, because they assign you. You don't have any choice of where you go. No right? choice, but it works different at different times. Um, so when I was there, uh, you got to pick, I think, three choices. And they didn't guarantee those or anything. Um, I mean you were very lucky to get, I got one of my top three. I actually got my number one. I wanted Houston um, for a lot of different reasons. So I chose Houston. I got Houston. And on the day you do this, it's like a huge pizza party. They've got a gigantic map. It's a huge day at for your class and at Quantico, this whole experience. They make it a big deal. They call your name, you come down, you pick out your envelope, and then there's a little flag on it that says where you're going. Oh, wow. And, and then you go and you put it on the map. And I mean, people in our class like had asked for Cleveland, Pittsburgh, whatever. I'll never forget this girl. Um, she goes, Jackson, Mississippi. And she looks at the map and she says, 
where's Mississippi? <laughs> and like everybody's helping her because she's a Northeast girl. Oh, wow. And then somebody else who wanted North Carolina, South Carolina, any place in the South, they got Pittsburgh. Oh, oh. boy. And he's like, oh, my God, Pittsburgh. Well, I did that on purpose. Pittsburgh. I yeah. So I was super lucky to get, only about probably out of my class of 30, maybe three or four of us got where we wanted. Very, very lucky with that. So I ended up where I wanted to go and I got on a great squad. I started out on what we call kind of a, a lead squad because I was a FIREA agent. They had to put me on a white collar squad, um, but I got on a white collar reactive squad um, that they had just instituted. Um, and basically what that was. So when a lead comes in from another office to do an arrest, uh, to do a search warrant, it was all quick hit, very reactive oh, stuff. Yeah. And you learn so much. Um, I think I, I was so lucky in so many respects. Like I didn't get, have to work applicants. Everybody back in that day, you got assigned to an applicant squad because they wanted you to understand the city, how to communicate with people, you know, be in situations that weren't necessarily dangerous when you first got on. But I was very lucky. I got on WC5 met great people there. And then I immediately, within less than a year, got on the organized crime squad and working drugs and gangs and dope and cartels. And it was so fun. <laughs> those were just the best days. Um, those were days before we even had to write out um, search warrant uh, plans. We literally would like write them out on the car. Oh, wow. Really? The car. Just we on the way. Yeah. Everything was just um, a lot less bureaucratic back in those days. Mm -hmm. And we had a tight squad. It was called DS2. Um, my supervisor was Dick Ludwig, who I think so much of. He taught me everything about the Bureau. Um, the first two weeks, he just said, I want you to understand informants, which was our 270 and 137 violate, or, um areas of our MIOG and MAOP, which are our manuals that we follow, um, our investigation manuals, and then also um, understand um, drug cases and violent crime. And so he just wanted me to understand, which is so smart. And I don't think people do this anymore. How can you investigate somebody for something and you don't even know what the law says? you know, what the elements are the law. Yeah. So he was, I thought, brilliant. And, and then at the end of two weeks, I had to come in and get quizzed. Oh, okay, wow. Jen, you got this, this, and this. Can you charge? Can you go out? Can you make an arrest? Is there probable cause? So he was an attorney and he taught me and others that came up through him how to investigate from a legal eye. I don't know how to say it any other way than that. Yeah, he was that makes sense. amazing. And um, we had a great squad, worked huge cases. Um, the main case I worked there was a cartel. It was a Medellin cartel uh, faction. And we went clear back to uh, Cali and Medellin, you know, our informants and how the narcotics all trickled in. Obviously, we had a lot of deaths and murders uh, that took place because these were ruthless gang members cartel members, I should say. Um, it was really one of the, just everything about it was great. Unfortunately, um, Dick Ludwig, who uh, I was under for about over nine years, uh, I was only on that squad and he just meant so much to me. Uh, after 9-11, uh, he was forced to retire. because In the Bureau, you're forced to retire. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it used to be at age 53. You just like age out. Yeah, you age out. I mean, they they want young, vibrant. It's a very physically demanding job. It's right. mentally demanding. You work ridiculous hours. And you need to have your head about you. What would now, a I typical... know you can run our country at the age of 80. <laughs> yeah. Dang it, you're not going to be an FBI <laughs> yeah, agent true. past the age of 55 <laughs> now. Right. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to think about. Yeah. What was a typical week like for you? Like, what were the hours? Tell her how bad it is. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you, everybody's different. I was an absolute Betty Bureau. That's what they called us. A Betty Bureau. A Betty Bureau. What does that mean? That means I was married to the FBI. 
I, I had no children. I wasn't married. And I lived for cases. So for me, I was there. Well, they used to have different rules. They, at one point, you had to come in and sign in before seven. And they had a sheet. So, you know, Jennifer signs in, you know, Swalik signs in, Louise signs in, everybody signs in. So you have to be really careful, right? Because um, if I sign in at, I'm supposed to be there, just say I'm supposed to be there at eight. I've signed in at 7.55. How did all those people come after me? Anyway, they try to regu- They used to try to regulate that um, just to make sure you were signed in. But honestly, your whole time, the whole, when I was in the bureau, if you were at your desk, you weren't working. You know, where are cases? They're on the streets. So that means you're doing surveillance. You're meeting with informants. People don't understand one thing, if I could stress about the bureau. The bureau makes cases because of informants. And if you didn't have an informant, you were judged very poorly. And when I say judged, you had what we call file reviews you had to do. And these file reviews, you had to go over every single thing you did on a case in that 90-day period, everything you did with informants. If you didn't have active informants giving you good information, you wouldn't get rated high. And what your goal was, was to get a perfect rating because that's how you got increases. Mm. You know, and that that's how you were judged. And then also they had great incentive programs. It might not seem like a lot to get a five hundred dollar incentive award or a thousand. The highest you could get when I was there was two grand. But it feels really good to get a two grand incentive award and be recognized yeah. for working your tail off. And because people in the bureau aren't really about money because you make yeah, no money. Right. You come in even now, I think it's fifty six thousand maybe. Wow. Back when I came in. Oh, Fifteen thousand? I don't know. Fifteen? I, mean. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. It's something yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I guess back then, yeah. And I wasn't in for the money. Nobody gets in for the money. You get in the bureau because you want to put bad guys in jail and you want to make a difference. And then there are some people I call them the ten percenters, the blue flamers, and they get in because they want to be in power and right. they want to control the FBI. And their whole trajectory from the minute they hit the door is how can I be in power? But most agents just want to put bad guys in jail. Sure, sure. So did you have to go out and get your own informants in or did you inherit informants? It no. was just purely, all right, You could get them. But how you get them, I mean, you, you were smart, hopefully, cultivating <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. So somebody careful. gets in, arrested, as an example, but they got arrested for, oh, uh, okay, I'll tell you one of our secrets that we did back in the day. Oh, we would sit out in front of the blood bank and people, believe it or not, that were low-level criminals often gave plasma outside oh, the blood bank. Interesting. And so you basically would ID them, and then you would develop, uh, you would find out whether they were wanted or not. This is proactive law enforcement. This is what we don't do anymore. This is what we should be doing. Now we react, mm-hmm. right? A crime happens, and then we go out, and we... And investigate it from that point right. versus before. And before we used to proactively look and then you'd say, oh, fugitive, you know, wanted for murder, wanted for this, wanted for that. And now you had them in your grasp. Mm-hmm. And so now you have them, you're interviewing them. Obviously, they're going to go to jail. But maybe you say something like, listen, um, do you have anybody who can help us? Maybe they couldn't help us, but maybe they'd say, oh, yeah, you know what? My girlfriend, she knows bad guy xyz perfect set me up with her and then i'll let that information known to the prosecutor and hopefully you could get some lenience with your sentence no guarantee though right no never a guarantee yeah you can never give them a guarantee yeah you could never guarantee but by the same point you you don't just throw that out i mean you knew that that would happen um you know that the prosecutor is going to look favorably on people who are trying to help Mm. and that's just the way it works you know if you're not cooperating you're going to get absolutely no consideration sometimes it's as little as you can be go to um, a prison that's where your family is Mm. Mm -hmm. or sometimes it's listen we can put fifty dollar in your commissary every week you know to have simple things like that yeah little things like that and so that that's just one way 
to cultivate a good informant. So, so when you would do that, are you, so you're outside the blood bank, take us through like, what, what's your moves there when you identify somebody who you think you want to well, you so know, make an informant for yourself? As an example, an informant could be a person in the blood bank, hypothetically. And if that person told you, because when you give blood, you have to give your name, your date of mm. birth, your full oh, identification. Yeah. Yep. And then they give that to you, and that's when you identify somebody as a fugitive. You already know who you're going to get. They tell you he's got on a yellow sweatshirt, so when he walks out, then you arrest him. Wow. And then you fingerprint him. You know, you obviously make sure he truly is that person that he says he is, which 100% of the time, they were that person, at least that I was involved with. Mm. And so that's how you do it. So you would just bring them in back to the FBI your office? office. Yep, where we'd process them, which means fingerprints, photographs, all their information, uh, Mirandize them, ask them if they want to talk or cooperate, take down any of those statements, and then hopefully cultivate perhaps an informant situation from that. What was your success rate? Oh, very good. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, because um, I don't know. I think I think a lot of FBI agents were, especially that were working violent crimes and that were working drugs, um, pretty high in terms of getting informants. I always had a lot of informants. Um, I had a great, great informant that really took down this particular cell, not the Medellin cartel, yeah, just yeah. a particular sure. cell of the Medellin cartel, and she was amazing. Um, she was the best informant, um, and she was very, very lucratively paid. Mm -hmm. She was the former girlfriend of a kingpin oh, wow. that was taken down. I mean, a huge kingpin wow. that got like 20 plus years. And she cooperated and um, I was her handler. Did you provide protection to her? Absolutely. I mean, even went to court and had her change, her name changed. Oh. And, you know, testified before yeah. the So the judge. Bureau takes that pretty seriously then as far mm -hmm. as like, protecting those informants very seriously and we never lost one that i was ever involved with um so yeah we just covered a case yeah. of a police department that literally the week before last that uh did a mm -hmm. horrific job at protecting this young college girl who they tried to flip on uh two two violent felons who ended up murdering her and they lost track of her they they wired her up for the drug uh the sting and everything and guys ended up shooting her you may be familiar with it rachel hoffman i don't know if you heard of that one yeah it's, yeah, it was it's just a really terrible. sad story she was really young and just completely unexperienced she was like a local uh marijuana dealer you know sold to a few people and well then just, well then they tried to have her go take down a much larger yeah, more and dangerous buy guns and all that. she was just so out of her element and they they lost track of her and yeah. I think the big difference between a local department yeah, I was gonna ask you that. and this is one of the main things that the FBI can do when we get involved in a case. We have so much money. You have case funds that every case has, which is tens of thousands of dollars. Mm. And then you have informant funds, which is up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. I was gonna ask about that. So when you yeah. have top level informants. Wow. So um we have money that can help make these things okay. In other words, that sure. can protect individuals, that can induce individuals to cooperate. And the local departments just don't have that kind of funding. And that's why the Bureau getting involved in a lot of these different cases, that's just one aspect that we bring to the table that's not talked about often. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point and an important point too, yeah. that the federal agencies are going to be far better funded. I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, you could trace a lot of the issues of local departments to funding. Um, 100%, especially when it comes to training. Yeah. The training is horrible. Most departments, you shoot once a year, they hand you your box of 60 rounds, yeah. 50 rounds, you shoot and that's it. Any other training you do is your responsibility. So you have to get range time, you have to pay for your ammunition. And, and it's terrible, they don't have instruction. But the Bureau has a program called the Law Enforcement Training for Street Survival. And that's a program specifically designed for agents to train locals. Oh, wow. To provide training on how to survive, you know, how to 
negotiate hostage situations, how to, you know, because they're on scene before the bureau can be there. You know, the initial officers or how to arrest somebody without getting killed at a house or when you're chasing somebody. So I was a law enforcement training, a let's, we call them uh, sur- or survival, not only did go through the program, but I became an instructor for the program. And that was some of the best, uh, most enjoyable training that I was involved with and, and was honored to be a part of because that really can help save lives because those guys don't get the training. They don't get a shoot and they don't get a train. What do you think are some of the biggest issues with local law enforcement these days when, when it comes to a training aspect and like being prepared for scenarios? Because it's, it's always, you know, whenever an officer is, is killed, I always look at and see what happened. And it's a lot of, there seems like it's a lot of the same scenarios that play out, unfortunately, uh, among different shootings. You know, I think so oftentimes these law enforcement officers, they're not trying to kill anybody. They just are so poorly trained. I saw a a video clip. I don't know if you guys have seen this. There's a guy laying on the ground. He's being arrested. He's fully cooperating. He's like, got his hands. And the, the guy that goes to arrest him has his finger on the trigger and he accidentally shoots him, the officer. Oh my God, I haven't seen that. He doesn't mean to shoot him. You know, just bad training. It's just finger off the trigger. Terrible training because they don't practice that. There's so many clips I see, and I see the officer's finger on the trigger, and I just you know, you can never have your finger off on the trigger unless you're ready to shoot somebody. Um, so I just think training is going to be the key to stopping all these horrible events that have caused the untimely and disastrous deaths of so many that are in custody. And I, I know there's egregious situations too. And mm-hmm. I'm not talking about egregious situations yeah. of police, police violence brutality or, and brutality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm switching to the gear of people who are just so poorly trained. Yeah. 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 And, and oftentimes, I mean, just kind of playing off that point, in so many cases that we cover, it's the small towns, it's the, mm-hmm. the small little local jurisdictions that just, they really have no clue, especially when it comes to being an investigator and, sometimes, and but, you know, sometimes, not always, but, but at least on a lot of the cases that we cover, it's usually, yeah. there's just a lack of experience in how to process a crime scene. How do you secure it? And even their detectives don't fully understand that. So evidence gets destroyed and people end up getting away with crimes they shouldn't. And it's just it's a it's a complex issue and i don't know if there's a simple solution to it but no definitely not i think it is training and experience though i always said it was a great thing when i made a mistake because then i learned from it you you can't know what you don't know of so course. you know what you know and you can easily do it and then the first time you see something that you've never seen and if you make a mistake at that you know that's just part of the learning and it's an everyday there was never one day in the FBI I didn't learn probably 10 things. There's probably not one day today that I don't learn 10 things, right? Yeah. You got to be open to it. But um, these, I feel terrible for these, you know, the Delphi case, the Moscow. But you know what? At Moscow, which is the Koberger case, of course, they did the right thing. They immediately got the state police involved. They immediately got the bureau. They yep. got 60 yep plus bureau agents full-time committed to that case. That's just unbelievable. So that's what it takes are these smaller departments saying, listen, I just do traffic stops and mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. deal with possession of marijuana. That's what I do all day. A quadruple right. murder that almost nobody sees. These small departments, I think, just need to recognize it, rope it off, call in the people who do it all the time, and then assist and learn from everything they see happening um, in case they have the next incident happen. Uh, Yeah, I love that outlook. Why do you think that doesn't happen quite as much? Obviously, the Bureau's not everywhere, too. They're not in every town in America, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's main hub cities, uh, usually. But why, why do you think that is? Why don't police departments, it seems like there's some pride involved with that. Like they, they want to solve it. You know, it's their chance to get recognition, right? They have this murder case. If they solve it, 
it looks really good for the department, perhaps more funding, but then they end up botching it or making mistakes that ultimately costs, you know, the victim from getting justice or the killer getting away. I, I think one of the biggest things, and, and I will let you know, because a lot of people don't know this, the Bureau is literally everywhere. We have main hubs, and then we have what, what they call RAs, resident agencies, that are little, they're all over the place. Like satellite offices, so little to speak. Little satellite yeah. offices. Yeah, I spent most of my career, other than Houston, for those nine years where I was in the main Houston office, the rest of my career was in resident agencies, the little agencies. And in the RAs, you handle every crime. So when you're in a main office, you're either on a white collar crime squad, a civil rights squad, on a drug squad, on a violent crime, whatever your squad you're, and that's all you work are those violations. But when you're when you're in an RA, you work every violation. So it's it's you become kind of a jack of all trades, but you learn a lot. But it it what it comes down to, I think, is having those RA, the SSRAs, which are the supervisory or the senior. Uh, resident agent making good liaison contacts with their local departments so they're on a first name basis on a cellular basis and so that they can reach out that's the piece that's missing oftentimes i was so glad to see moscow that's so far away from salt lake city salt lake city is the main office that would handle that and then they have hubs ras in like Billings and in um, Boise, uh, in and around those areas. But you see, it's it, that's what the difference could be. Can you? Sorry, I know you're wanting to move on to some oh, other no, stuff. Oh no, it's okay. I just I have a question about jurisdiction. So obviously, that's 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 kind of a huge huge part of it yeah. too. Is like at what point is it the FBI's jurisdiction as opposed to local, county, state? jurisdiction and when you know are those lines cross over can you kind of explain that because yeah it's actually this is going to be a really easy answer it's never the fbi's jurisdiction unless it crosses lines unless there's a kidnapping involved um other than that a murder is going to be that jurisdiction that it lies in um now they can give jurisdiction to say their state authority but typically the prosecuting office is going to be that. That's why you see in Moscow, it's the little Lata County yeah. is where the courtroom is and it's Lata County judge. And yeah. that's why, um, because they, they get to handle all their crimes. And it, it's a, a lot of people ask me, well, Brian Koberger drove across the country. He was arrested in Pennsylvania. Why can't the bureau swoop in and say, listen, he committed the crime and then escaped or somehow that venue is never going to hold really? or the fact that he went from Washington into Moscow, right? Pullman, Washington yeah. crossed over and went to commit mm -hmm. the crime. Possibly you could find a um, venue, federal venue there and they could have prosecuted. But I think because this case really came down to being committed in Moscow, um, uh, they wanted that case. They wanted the FBI's help, but they didn't want a diehard, you know, Johnson, the special agent Johnson, we're taking over. Sure. You know, it, people envision that it happens like that. It really doesn't happen like that anymore. Hmm. So had, so, and, and like serial killers, and I mean, haven't had a whole lot like we did in the 80s, 70s, where they're moving around quite a bit across, mm -hmm. you know, state lines and and you know, they do a few over here, over here, over here and the FBI is ultimately getting involved at that point. And that's because they're kind of spread out, right? And that it makes more sense for them to come at it from that angle then. A 100%. Anytime you have multiple jurisdictions involved, the bureau is going to get involved and the bureau can be the lead agency and the prosecution or potentially a prosecutorial agency um, and because they can handle the liaison because we have offices everywhere. Remember when uh, we were talking about leads, I was a lead agent. So I would get a lead from Los Angeles or from Philly because that fugitive was where I was at or that search warrant needed to be done because they knew whatever drugs or money was in a certain spot, whatever it might be. So the Bureau has this beautiful luxury because we have, we can go anywhere. 
and we have federal authority everywhere. Whereas if you are in Moscow and Moscow PD, you can't do anything in Pullman, Washington. Right. You know, so you're very, very limited. It's easier to send an FBI agent out to go and arrest somebody who's running right, across the right. country versus trying to like contact the local agency right. who may not be aware and have them go and find them. And it, it makes, I mean, it makes sense. And in fugitives, uh, what the local jurisdiction will do is they'll work with a, a FBI agent or a U.S. Marshal and get what we call a UFAP, an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. And that gives full authority to the federal authorities now to be the lead and to handle that capture without any involvement necessarily of the local authorities. Interesting. It's pretty cool. Did you ever do any fugitive? Oh, lots of fugitives. Yeah. Yeah. What was like your favorite, favorite part of that? Uh, Favorite part of the FBI, like my favorite crime to work? Or just like catching fugitives. Oh, yeah. the favorite part of catching a fugitive is when you catch them. Yeah. <laughs> when you when you sit there, my favorite fugitive story, favorite favorite was in Houston and um we had indicted about 50 Medellin cartel members. We had a wire up. Wow. Forever. And so whenever you have a wire back in that day, it'd be a lot harder now, but you hear all their conversations. And so we would be taking down loads, you know, we'd hear about this load and then you work with the local authorities to take it down. You're sitting there in the car watching it all, you know, and it's just so fun. Um, But the best fugitive was we, our main, everything went south. We were in Miami, in New York. My informant was all over um, delivering money, picking up dope. Well, not picking up dope exactly. Dope would be dropped and she was the money person. So you have to be very careful with rules with all of that. Um, we made her the money person because when you're the dope person, then you have yeah. you have to take down the dope. Yeah. We took down a lot of dope, but we tried to keep her on the money side. Anyway, everything went to hell. Can I say that? Yeah. I'm really not yeah. a big no. cusser. Yeah. Oh, we well, you're we good. are. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you're good. It all went bad because you're not going to believe this, but we, this whole case was going down at a beautiful five star Marriott oh, in wow. the Miami area. When I say going down, like transactions, dope, Medellin cartel members, informants, FBI agents, it was all going down. The management knew. And I don't know why we had to even tell them. Maybe it was so we could park illegally near the valet so we could quickly, whatever reason, they let the valet know. An agent did that. I don't know what agent. That valet called up to the room and said, it's a whole sting. It's going south. And they almost killed my informant. Oh, my God. Because they were like, who's the snitch? Well, yeah. she wasn't from there. She was the only new character in their normal. So they knew right away. Wow. Oh, yeah. They, and she's like, get me out of here. So we had to, I mean, I had to get her. We had to get everything out. We had to just drop everything. Well, what happened was then we ended up indicted everybody, but everybody was in the wind. Our main people went back to Medellin, We lost them. I'm like, oh my God, we lost, we just have lost all our six main IBMers. Yeah. Wow. I called them like IBMers because this, these weren't low, these people don't use, these people are Mm -hmm, mm multi-millionaires who come and handle things, handle the distribution. Anyway, I had got an informant tip months later, like six months later, that they were back in town. <laughs> the name of the case was Los Tios, the, the uncles. That the Los Tios were back in town and their other close high associates. And that they would always go eat at this one particular uh, Colombian restaurant in kind of South Houston. And so, like, okay, no problem. I'm just going to go there every day. So every day, either in the morning I'd go, or in the afternoon, of course I came up with zero. And two weeks into it, I went at a different time. I went at an off time. 
like seven in the morning or something mm. when the restaurant really shouldn't be open. Lo and All behold. six of them that were there. <laughs> oh my God. All of them sitting at a table. Wow. And other people are around, you know, some yeah. bad guys. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, one DS2, this is 10 DS2. I need <laughs> units here now. I've got Los Tios. You know, we got to take this down. I, I, I was so young. I was probably <laughs> how exciting I was so at that age yeah. it's hard to explain the, the hours you know 20 yeah. hour days running surveillance wow. running, uh listening to all these calls yeah. um and and then to see them all there I couldn't believe it of course everybody's like we're trying to get there it's Houston it's yeah. like eight in the morning yeah right I mean traffic, traffic is horrible yeah. and I'm sitting there and then I noticed that they start noticing me so it was how far a, away are you from that? Oh, I'm parked right in front of the restaurant. <laughs> wow. But I don't look like an FBI agent. No. So I go in and I, I can't remember what I was wearing, but I remembered I put on like a little workout thing and I was like stretching. <laughs> I had my, I was like, Just I don't like know that. why I thought that <laughs> them thinking I was doing yoga would make them think I was an FBI agent, but they certainly were like, I don't know who that crazy girl is, is out there in the parking lot, but surely not law enforcement. Whatever. Yeah. So a guy named, I'll only say his first name, Kevin, who was on my squad. They all, so they all, those TOs and their crew all got up to leave. And Kevin uh, pulls up. I go, dude, we got to take this down. He's like, Jen, it's you and me. We can't take it out. We're taking it down. And so, remember, I was young, and it was way before the rules were as tight as they are now. Yeah, yeah. We storm in there. We just arrest the whole restaurant. <laughs> We're like, FBI! It was something out of uh, Miss Congeniality. Yeah. And believe wow. me, when Miss Congeniality came out, yeah. I got sent that video multiple occasions. That's I mean, so I got funny. a nickname. And we're like, FBI. So your gun's Dude, out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Get down, get down, the get ground. down. Yeah. God, that's got to be so Two of them ran that we, oh, I bet. we couldn't they were get. Like, There's six of us, so. But we got everyone else and nobody got shot. And everything was fine. And later units came. We just hauled everybody at bay until, you know, other units came. <laughs> that was my, the most exciting fugitive case. Oh, I'm sure. That's a back in the day case. That I would can't never imagine happen. the adrenaline. The, it's thrilling. It was so thr exciting, like out of a movie to me. <laughs> it was out of a movie. It would never happen now. It, people would get in trouble. And, and actually, Kevin and I got in a little bit of trouble. Oh, I was going to ask. So it, was it good for your career? or it was, What'd your uh, boss say? I mean, Dick Ludwig. Uh, he was like, Jennifer. Hey, yeah, good job. And then he's like, way to go. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, yes. I mean, everybody was You did your job. I mean, that's King what you're supposed to do. They got over 20 years. I mean, wow. it was, the, we were so happy. I think that later... I think maybe they only ended up serving like 15, but it was a huge hit. It was a huge case. And um, it was great. So changing gears a little bit. Yeah, earlier sorry. we had talked. No, don't be sorry. That was such an interesting story. I just really want to be able to ask you about this. Your experience as a woman in the FBI, mm -hmm. because we, we discussed this a little bit earlier. And how, I mean, how many women were on your squad? Oh, geez. On DS2. Well... When I first went over to DS2, I don't know if there were any when I first came. Really? Yeah. But then we got Janet, who became an assistant director in the FBI later. She was only on the oh, squad wow. a short time, but she really moved her way up through the ranks. And then we got another gal who I also really liked, but she was pregnant the whole time. She did a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Hmm. Um, mostly like in the office stuff. Administrative stuff. Yeah, but important stuff like, as an example, um, deciphering phone records, mm. you know, really looking at, at who shot John, so to speak. I mean, who was calling who, when, where, what, mm -hmm. things like that. Very valuable. So very, very valuable. Um, her name was Stephanie. Stephanie and Janet? <laughs> so three of you. What about in the <laughs> academy? Was it... How many? Four of us. Four. Wow. Out of how many? Four of us. There were 30. 30. See, that's and there were only so three impressive. classes, I think, that were there when I was there. Did you ever face, which I'm sure you did, any type of sexism or people who doubted you 
or moments like you were telling me about earlier about Kendall Gray. What kind of a loaded question is that? Just get out the pepper spray. Shoot me right in the face. Um, I mean, we discussed it earlier. You're, I wanted to hear about your experience with court. I wanted people to hear that story yeah. if you're comfortable sharing because it's, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Um, you know, obviously there were issues and there can be issues. But First of all, 15 years on the SWAT team, three different SWAT teams. So I was on the Dallas SWAT team, Houston SWAT team, the San Juan SWAT team. Mm -hmm. Those guys were really great. I mean, the biggest place that, I mean, it was really hard to get on. And there was a huge group that didn't want me on. Um, but, you know, in time, I'd like to think I became like a sister to them. Mm -hmm. It was funny. I was just in Dallas and Dallas was my second SWAT team. Mm -hmm. And... um I, I, I'll, I'll share this story. So uh, I moved to Dallas from Houston. I'd been on the Houston SWAT team and the Houston team is an enhanced team An enhanced team. Uh, there's only a few of them. And what they do is they assist worldwide issues that come up. So we train every week. Uh, we get to train with the hostage rescue team. Uh, it's very exciting to be on an enhanced team. Mm -hmm. So here I go from an enhanced team that has three teams within a team. We have a sniper team, we have gold team, and we have blue team. I was on gold team. I was a gold team PFI, which is primary firearms instructor. I was a very, what I think I was, you know, a big part of that team. Mm -hmm. And um, at tryout was three days long of absolute hell. Um, they'd never had a woman, obviously, in Texas on a team. And there was only one other woman ever in the bureau at that time. Uh, she was on Miami's team, really like her, um, but she um, only ended up staying on the team for a short time, but she was a great gal and somebody I really looked up to. And uh, here I go to the Dallas team and another person at the same time from another team transferred into the Dallas team. And so I let them know, you put in a communication. I said, I'm going to go out for the Dallas team. And I was told by the SWAT team leader, um, that I had to try out again, you know, all over again. I'm like, fair enough. I think that's right. You need to see what I can and cannot do shooting wise, judgment wise, physical wise. And so um, then I found out that somebody else who had just transferred in with me was allowed to just be on the team. Mm, interesting. And I said, wait a minute. Why is he on the team? When I transferred here at the same time, and I'm not on the team. Mm -hmm. So the people in charge, I always loved this. I was Koffendaffer, and they were Lukenhoff and Deffenbaugh. <laughs> like, it was just so funny to me that we had like this German contingent. Yeah. And um, Deffenbaugh and Lukenhoff really weren't having any of that. They were like, either let her on or have him try out. Yeah. So they told him he had to try out. And actually he's, he's not with us anymore. So I don't want to say anything negative, but he decided not to try out. Hmm. So I tried out and, um, you know, had a really good tryout. The guys were all great and, um, made the team. So it, it all, it's amazing. It all, it all worked out. Yeah. And in fact, there's one thing we have to do. We have to run like an 880, but it's a little longer because you you start out. 880. Oh, 880 yards. So two tracks. Okay. Yeah. To think of it in terms of like a quarter mile. So it's a half a mile. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you have to start by uh, you, you run and then you do this little obstacle, which is basically in and out of cones that makes it a little bit longer. And then you have to pick up uh, a, a SWAT operator that's, it, full body armor, which is about 60 pounds. Maybe not quite 60, but close to that. And um, so we come around and there were two of us. So the idea for me was I have to beat him in the first quarter mile. And thankfully, the one thing I ran all through my best sport, even though I played all the sports, my best sport was track. And my best sport was the quarter mile or best Part of track, the, the, my event was the quarter mile. So I took off like a <laughs> shot out of a cannon 
because the two people laying there, one guy was a guy named Matt. I won't name his last name. A 200 pound beast. <laughs> and the other guy next to him was probably about a 165 pound guy. Yeah. And I was like, I just got to get to him. <laughs> so I thought I had gotten to him, but they said I missed a cone. So I had to go back. Oh, no. And grab that cone. Doing again, yeah. So I grabbed that cone. So now I'm not there first. And the guy that was running, competing with me, who did he grab? The lighter one. I'm going to ask you guys, who do you think he grabbed? The lighter one. He, of course, grabbed the lighter run because he wants to make the team too. Yeah. yeah. Leaving me with the beast. Oh Matt the beast. He knows that if he ever watches this, he'll know exactly. I barely, I somehow pick him up. I get him and you have to pick him up so he's clean. You've got him clean. He's like six foot two. He's huge. Matt. And I got him and just adrenaline pushed me through the 10 yards you have to carry him. Oh, man. So I get him and I stop and, and I make the time. Everything's good. Sadly, though, that guy I went around with, they did not pick him for the team. Oh, oh really? really? Even though he did great. And he later, he made the team a year later. Mm. Uh, but, but this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Even though there's sexism, if you will, that obviously d does exist. Those guys looked at that and they said, was that a team player? Mm. Was that a team player that yeah. you had the 110-pound girl lift in a... 225 pounds, six foot two guy, and not because they obviously had put them down there, meaning yeah. for me to get the lighter one and for him to get the other one. But to his credit, if somebody's down in a house and you have to pull them out, an yeah. operator, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to pick and choose. No. Oh, the guy that went down is 225. You need to grab him or whatever it is. Right. It doesn't matter what weight they are. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't have a problem with it, but they did. So yeah. that's what I'm trying to say is even though there were things that were unfair, I think most of the guys were really tried to be really fair. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. You yeah. know, and of course, that's not everyone is everyone's experience. But yeah, that's I think it's inspiring for other people out there, especially women who want to get into law enforcement or maybe nervous about it or have heard stories to hear success stories like you who have, you know, proven yourself. And I am curious, though, about the time you were telling me with court and your dress, oh. you know, beyond the FBI. That's yeah. what I was really getting out. It's your time in the industry, what you've experienced as a woman and people who have doubted you or treated you different. So uh, in my first trial, and by the way, your first trial in the Bureau, this is the old Bureau. It was a big deal. Um, Dick Ludwig was an old school, trained under Hoover from New York. Like he was old school Hooverite. And the guys on my squad were too. I had two other guys that were Hooverites, you know, they were all old. And um, so I go into court, which is, they call it trial for a reason. That's why they say people go through trials, right? Mm. In their lives. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's a trial. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be so prepared. Um, the prosecutor, you are like your prosecutor's um, evidence brain. He has the legal brain. And then he combine, combines it with the facts that you know, because you've been the one working on the case the whole time. Yeah. And so it's a wonderful synergy. And um, it's one, I loved working with all my attorneys. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Anyway, I, I was there probably at six in the morning. I mean, as soon as I could possibly get in, setting everything up. I got all my boxes. I got everything organized. I can quickly go to this interview or this surveillance or whatever to show, to hand to my prosecutor, you know, to roll with everything. And I'm setting everything up and I am dressed in a black uh, suit with pants, a black pantsuit. Mm -hmm. And the clerk of courts, who in the Murdoch case is becoming very famous right now. Oh, the, the same person? no. Just from the standpoint oh, of oh, clerk of yeah, courts, okay. right? Because yeah. clerk of courts have so much power. I mean, cl clerk of courts run the show. Really? They're the maestro. Hmm. Um, anyway, she comes over to me and she says, um, you know, Miss Coffendaffer, uh, we do not allow pantsuits in our courtroom. You need to have on a skirt. You're a woman. You're a young lady. You need to have a skirt on. I'm like, oh, because this is my first trial. Like, Oh no. I'm already freaking yeah. out. I want everything to be You're perfect. Like, what? And and I say, 
I have no skirt. And she said, you will not allow to, you know, be in this courtroom participating chair to the That's prosecutor without that. So, what year was this? This was my first trial was uh, 19, I want to say 92. Okay. Maybe 93, 92, 93. So I call back to my boss. I'm like, I'm in a hot mess right here. Like <laughs> trial is in an hour and I can't be in this courtroom with a pantsuit on. He goes, don't worry. So he gets an agent assigned to drive to my place at clear up in Copperfield from Houston and bring me a skirt and brought it back. And I got all changed and everything wow. worked out. And I knew I could never be out of a a dress attire and I never in any courtroom from that point on wore anything but a skirt at least that I could ever remember I mean I learned my lesson because I didn't ever want that to happen again wow that's that's fascinating wow different were, times definitely different times yeah. um were there any situations in your career where being a woman helped you or you had an advantage because of it probably uh, all the time all the time <laughs> yeah from interviewing i'll tell you people i truly believe this and I, i'm not trying to say anything bad against my colleagues like my male colleagues men typically they want to confess to a woman over a man and this is why i think it is i think we're less like they feel less judged i might be all wet about this but in my experience you could get a hardened horrible criminal to and and find some sort of common space and show some sort of empathy to get that confession mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and to try to connect and so i think definitely in the interviewing situation probably because they feel very you know like you're not a threat to them in any way so definitely in interviewing um the other thing is in surveillance i could basically go anywhere and nobody thought i was an fbi agent in fact, this is a funny story. Brand new agent. This was still when I was on that first drug school or that first white collar WC5. I go to this, um, I'm serving a uh, subpoena, I believe. And so I, it's to a president of a corporation though. And so I go to the secretary, I, I walk in. You don't have to be with anybody for size. Like it's not a dangerous situation. So it was just me. And uh, you know, hi, Jennifer. I wasn't even coughing daffer back then. Here's my credentials. And um, she goes, oh, yeah, right. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Hank is playing a joke on Ed. Oh, great. You're a stripper, right? You're going to go in oh, there and you're going to take it off. This is going to be hilarious. All right, let's roll. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm really Jennifer with the FBI. <laughs> and these are real FBI credentials, and I really need to serve him. <sighs> oh, that is so, my wow. God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, it was, it, there were multiple, that's the worst, but multiple times like that, you know, where you're just not believed because you don't have the, the, the like classic look or whatever, the, the look that the men know. in black look. Yeah. 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 Wow. So. That is wild. <laughs> But I believe it. I honestly believe yeah, it. Yeah, I do too. It's yeah, just, I can totally see that happening, like yeah. playing out in my mind. That's wild. And it, and it was also great. I worked a lot of undercover. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, can under you tell us some of your experience doing that? Um, or is that kind of? I've got a kind of a good one. Okay. I'll do it. I'll do it quick. Okay. I'm glad you guys can edit. I'll just chop all this down. <laughs> um. So, uh, the case is called the headlines read in the Houston Chronicle, pain for the prosecution. Her last name was Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. Um, but Payne meaning pain. Anyway, uh, I was undercover to befriend a, a district attorney who was using cocaine and possibly distributing cocaine, just involved with possession of cocaine. No one really knew to what degree. It was informant information that we had. Mm -hmm. So uh, these informant roles that I got were always kind of a little bit on the uncomfortable side sure because typically i was a girlfriend of somebody of the main player in this case you know i had to befriend somebody which is never fun to do i mean because then you have to turn your back on him oh, i'm sure that's so hard 
Yeah, it's gain sad. their trust and I know betray them. But she was a, a assistant district attorney betraying the trust of the people, yeah. putting people in jail for cocaine possession when she was possessing cocaine and using wow. cocaine and uh, an addict on the job. Wow. And making judgment decisions and, you know, it was wrong. So I befriended her. She, of course, used cocaine in front of me. Wow. And then everybody came in, you know, we had an undercover apartment and it, of course, there's cameras, everybody's ready to roll. So you set her up and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Over time. Yeah. Gosh, that's got to be nerve wracking. Do you remember, <laughs> did you guys make like eye contact when that happened? Like, Well, I went down too. Oh, so you're so she thinks you're going down. That's oh, right. yeah. That's like good. I mean, I was crashed to the ground too. Yeah, I mean the the hardest problem with those kinds of cases is not using when they think you should be using because you're, you know, part of the game, right? Mm -hmm. Only you can't. So you 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 just come up with different ways to pretend to different ways to, um. Would you get Excuse in trouble that. if you did, though? Oh, you can't. You can't at all? Oh, no, 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 never. Mm -mm. Do some and agents do? And I never do? did. No. No? No, no, no. That's a, that's a bright line. That's that a, they make very clear before you? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, no. you, no, you can't. You can't. No. Guess but you, you, can, you can get out of it. I mean, people are normal. You know, they might be drug dealers, but they're still normal sure. from the standpoint of, you can just say, you know, like uh, one thing I always did was uh, I always wanted to have a drink first, you know, so mm -hmm, they'd already yeah. be partaking and then I could be, you know, pouring a drink. Yeah. That was a very good excuse. Mm -hmm. um, so. That makes sense. I could ask you about your experiences all day and I think oh, we've no. got to have you back because there's, there's a few other things we want to get to. Before we start getting into, I want to ask you about some high profile cases, mm -hmm. which you are, have some very good insight on as of right now. But before we jump into that, can you explain what you do now? With oh, Eagle yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, right now uh, I am a contributor for News Nation. Mm -hmm. So I'm their law and justice contributor. That's one thing where I basically try to analyze what a... Um, a fact or a clue or a piece of information would mean mm -hmm. to a case and what would be the next steps and things like that from what we know. Yeah, that's how we first found you actually when we were researching the Gabby Petito case and following all of that and I started seeing you. And I think I, I did actually, I used a clip of you in one of my videos. So it's very surreal having you wow. here now after yeah. all this time because that was, yeah, that was uh, 2020. Um, I believe, is that right? 2020? 2020, I think so. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it was, yeah, 2021. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that was all surreal to me because I was doing my, um, you know, my self-defense classes and working for Eagle and got the call from one of the guys I told you would be my hearse carrier. I know that's morbid to think of, but I have everything <laughs> I lined out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, he, um, he called and just said, hey, there's this Gabby Petito case and I'm not doing, he was an analyst for a contributor for ABC for like seven years, but he changed careers and was into um, security details uh, over all this casinos that are owned by, he took a big job. He's, he's, I cannot go sit at Brian Laundry's house. Can you go? And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And anyway, he was the whole reason um, then a producer called me and talked and um, I think I sent them my bio and my CV and um, then I went to go hang out with Brian Enton. We love Brian. We, we love News love Nation. Brian. Brian's so awesome. He's great. It'd he would be, be so a great, I mean, he's so busy, but um, I would love to yeah, meet a great him one day and talk to, to him. Yeah. Yeah. That'd he's really super cool. great. Um, but anyway, so I do that um, with Eagle. Eagle was put together by a guy who, he is so interesting. He was the, I believe, first hostage rescue team commander in chief and um, just the godfather of SWAT tactics and everything else. Wow. Talking to you, Roger. Um, <laughs> he's amazing. 
like when I was a baby agent and when I was a SWAT, you know, just got on SWAT. I mean, I looked up to him so much and I did a lot of operations um, where he was in command. Mm -hmm. Um, Particularly, I say a lot, a huge one that was down in Puerto Rico. I mean, I don't even know how many hundreds of people were arrested. It was a huge deal. And so they brought in all the SWAT teams, but he was one, I think he was the overall command leader for that. He, he's amazing. After he retired, he wanted to start a company, which he started Eagle, to provide protection for high dollar clients. Um, so he started out really with the, I believe, the Seminole Nation and helped with that security detail. And then, mm. you know, his sense, lots of high profile clients. Um, so I started working for Eagle right when I retired. Um, but the area I got into, was another branch and it's called um, expert witness. And so what I do is uh, it's so much easier than contributing on television. I get to look at the entire case files um, of different cases. Um, I have how many homicides? I can't remember how many homicides now. Um, Maybe I've had um, five homicides cases. and many other kinds of cases with them. So I get to look at the whole case file and then make a, an opinion as to whether the actions that were done were legal and whether they were in keeping with what should have been done. Okay. So that's what I do for them. And then I go and I get deposed and I testify. It's horrible. And I write these gigantic reports. I think the last report I did was, one was 110 pages, the other was over 110 80. 110 pages. Wow, yeah, that's tedious. So are you like rewriting yeah. the whole, is that just your opinion? Or is that, are it's you my like opinion. putting in all of your reasons for why you think this is? So the first probably four pages to five pages are just my experience. How am I even qualified to comment on the case? And then, um, so I have to cite exactly my experience and then what, you know, prove that. Like at the bottom, I have all my certifications, everything. Then after that, the big body of the whole thing, I do a background section next, which is who shot John? How did all of this go down? That's usually can be four to five pages. And then the next part is all applic- applying. Uh, the legalities, applying everything that happened and why it should or shouldn't have happened and all the facts that go into that. So, I mean, some of these cases are six, 7,000 pages of oh information gosh. I have to look through. Whoa. Horrible. How long does it take oh you to get through something like that? Hours, weeks. Yeah, I, I have one right now in New York that I thought there was going to be a summary judgment And there isn't, I just found out before I came here, there isn't going to be a submarine judgment. Um, I've been deposed already. And so, you know, I'll have to fly there and and testify uh, um, on that. And that, that's been going on, I think three years or more. That's why everybody says Brian Koberger in October. I just laugh. I know you, you had told us that early on when we were, you know, just discussing off the record, the case. And you were like, Nah, that's not going to happen. And yeah, you were right. I actually made vacation plans. I was so certain that the uh, uh, preliminary hearing wasn't going to happen mm-hmm. and that the trial wasn't going to happen because there would be no reason to have a preliminary hearing when you can indict somebody in a grand jury. Yeah. It sounded incredibly rushed when they first, you know. Yeah. They, I mean, they say whatever. But um, can you also explain how you founded Beyond Firearms International or Firearms Beyond International? Yeah, you know, it occurred to me when I was getting ready to retire uh, that all this training, thousands of hours of training was really wasted on me from the standpoint of who really needs that training are individuals, citizenry. Mm -hmm. Because when you get attacked, the police aren't there. The FBI certainly isn't there. Nobody's there. You're there. And so what a good thing it would be to pass down all of this body of information, training, knowledge, all these situations I've been in 
not only in the training environment, but the real environment and give it to people who could actually use it. And so that was the whole idea behind it. Um, and then also marksmanship, all these people carrying guns that have no idea how to, I, I laugh that to get a driver's license, you have to have like six months in school. You have to yeah, practice right, yeah. all the time. You don't need anything. Take this big test. And they'll give a gun to almost anybody. Yep. And so it occurred to me that that might be a good thing to ha to offer basic, intermediate, and advanced firearms courses for people. And I've had SWAT guys go through. An FBI SWAT guy named Brian. Wow. Only see his first game. I show up to class. I'm like, Brian, you should be helping me teach. What are you doing? <laughs> he cracks me up. He's like, no, I need some more. Ah, okay, Brian. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, I love it. I'm very limited now. Um, not only because Eagle is, keeps me super busy, obviously my family, um, uh, contributing for news nation and doing documentaries and other things. But, um, the biggest reason I only now do, you have to pretty much know me uh, and, and then I'll do a class. So typically I'm hired like one of the biggest classes I just finished, I say just finished, it's been about a year now. I went to Montana for five days. And this this was a high dollar client and he just wanted me to come for five days. He wanted me to teach his entire family self-defense, marksmanship, firearms, tactics. So that's what I did. And wow. he took amazing care of me. I had my own cabin. He had 32,000 acres wow. in Montana. Wow. Um. I mean, he owned a huge portion of that and then he leases the rest from the government. It was the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. But um, but I the reason he knew me was through uh, an author who wrote uh, the book Red Sea, who also wrote and followed me around for a year when I was an FBI agent, a Glamour article. Oh, and interesting. That's huh. why my nickname on the SWAT team was G1. <laughs> Glamour one. <laughs> um, That's funny. So anyway, I tried, and this is why you're sitting there. It occurred to me as I was teaching, I am teaching all these strangers, mm -hmm. and especially remember the Navy SEAL that was shot. Um, just trying oh, to yeah. help out. Yep. And and I thought I can, I cannot take the time and the expense to do a full background on these people to see if they have any mental problems, to see if they've been arrested, just everything it would involve. I mean, some of my classes were, you know, dozens of people. Yeah, One class had a, a, close to a hundred people in it. So anyway, I, that's when I made the decision um, not long ago, probably two years ago, when I got really busy with the expert work. If you know me, I'm all in for teaching you. Or if you know me and 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 you have somebody you can refer, I'll do it. But I've really limited what I teach now. I have taught two Twitter classes. I call oh, them really? Twitter classes. People that I've met on Twitter that live close and that you know I've communicated with for a couple of years on Twitter that uh, you know I could tell just were amazing and lived close to where I've lived. So I've done at least one. To, I think I've done two. Twitter classes and the oh, people were cool. great. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so awesome. So I noticed on your Eagle bio, there was a little blip in there about working with the NFL. And I had to ask you, I'm a big NFL <laughs> football fan. So I had to ask you about that and what your involvement with them is. You know, I have literally been in depositions, legal depositions, talking about these important cases where people are dead. And I have had defense attorneys say, really quick, can we just talk about that NFL thing? <laughs> <laughs> just like that. So yeah. funny. Um, so right when I got out of the bureau, I was super lucky. A lot of FBI agents, um, they run a company that are, they're basically headhunters for the NFL, NHL, MLB, all the professional sports, because um, they need people in the security and, and different aspects. So there's a company uh, that reached out to the Jacksonville office because I was in Jacksonville when I retired, asking if anybody had recently retired that might be interested in an opportunity with the NFL. They happened to call literally one of my best friends there who was like, oh, yes, why I do. And so then they interviewed me 
And then the NFL interviewed me to be what they call a spot checker. So I worked my paychecks. Everything that I did was for the National Football League. And my goal is, or not goal, but my job was to go to practices. And because I was in Jacksonville, my team was the Jaguars. So I would go to Jaguar practices and make sure people that were on IR were truly not practicing, that people who weren't practicing, why aren't they on, on IR? Uh, were they following the rules in terms of pads? Were they following oh, interesting. in terms of hitting? You know, there's very protocols and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, really, I was there as a protection mechanism for the players mm, um, to make sure their health and everything that was happening, how long are the practices, all of that. So I did that um, for several years and then, and people are going to hate me. You <laughs> might not like me either. Um, Stop. The, um, when COVID happened, uh, all signed up, good to go. You know, they said, okay, you need to be there this date. Okay. They said, by the way, we didn't see your COVID certification. COVID cert, you mean that I have my shot? Yeah. Well, that's because I haven't had my shot. You didn't get a COVID shot? No, you see that whole, no, I don't trust it. I'm not going to get it. I said, well, all right, we're going to save your job for one year. And probably in a year, they won't have that protocol. Well, guess what? They still had that protocol. And mm -hmm. I get why. Mm -hmm. They're protecting players earning millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And the last thing they need is, Jennifer spot checker to somehow carry COVID to them and have them be out through games and they lose through games and it costs these owners millions. Mm -hmm. So I totally understand. Um, but I, like many others, I am deathly allergic to hundreds of medications. How did I find out? I found out when I was um, in, initially when I was in about seventh grade and I was given um, a medicine called Compazine because I was on erythromycin for you know bronch i get bronchitis about once a year and i was so young and i had compazine so i wouldn't throw up so things like compazine reglan finagrin you know they're the don't throw up pills and so i went dystonic which i don't know if you know what dystonia is if you ever don't seen you basically are frozen like that. whoa oh. just frozen Wow. It's horrible. And oh so my I went God. Into dystonia and anaphylaxis. They really didn't know what was wrong with me then because it was so long ago. But then uh, they ultimately determined, you know, obviously they changed the medication. And so they said, well, it's compensating. Well, many years later, I had an accident and had to get surgery on my neck. And they gave me for nausea again because I don't react well with a lot of medications. I become very sick and I became sick. And so they gave me another medicine called Reglan. Hmm. I was in the hospital over 30 days in anaphylaxis wow. shock wow. and almost lost my life. Um, hmm. I cannot do medicines. I can't do new medicines. They gave me the list. It's like 300 medicines I can't take. Yeah. And I don't blame you for, for being this cautious. brand new yeah. medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in my body that I can't get rid of. It's not like a pill I can stop taking. I, I, there's no way I could take it. And so yeah. I still haven't taken it. Mm -hmm. And I will not take it because I don't want to lose my life over worrying about losing my life. Yeah. Getting the flu. Yeah. I get that. I get that. And I don't, we don't have to put that on there, but that's why. Oh, no, that's fine. So I ended up after that um, politely saying I cannot sure. do yeah. that job. Okay. Well, that answers. answers but I my question. loved that yeah. job. It, it sounds so like a really cool fun, job. Yeah, I'm behind sure. the scenes. So and sure. fun. The behind the scenes, the people. Um, you know, Fournette was one of my favorites. I could say that. Hi, Fournette. Yeah. Um, he was so great. Just so nice and funny. It was interesting seeing people's personalities. So and, you get to talk to the players and oh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just ask know, them how it's you know. going. But Fournette would just come over and always talk to me. I don't know why. He'd just be like, "Hey." you know because you become known mm -hmm. yeah i always felt it was very important to go in a suit the bureau that i grew up in you always suit. wore a suit yeah you arrested somebody you were in a suit which was a dress usually where'd me. you have your gun strapped um i multiple areas um but under usually, the underarm 
No, I never really was big into that. I had one of or those like a shoulder behind. holster. I have this. I have this great video, and it's a woman with eight weapons on her: <laughs> guns, knives, and you can't even tell. Wow. It, Guns are way more easily concealed than people think. I could definitely be in here with probably four and you wouldn't even know. Wow. In my boots. How many do you have right now? Here. <laughs> I actually don't because I'm traveling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you can conceal weapons a little bit more easily, I think, than people think as a yeah. woman. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, for a while, I, I could never that. take the thing off for all those years. Oh, I'm sure. And, and if I did, I felt naked. Oh, I'm sure. So, did yeah. you ever fear for your life? Was there any? Sorry. Oh, yeah. A few times. Um. Because that, that was like always my, the one thing I would think about is just, especially when you have a family and, you know, at that level, you're dealing with organized crime and a lot of, you know, dangerous people who do a lot of horrible things. And mm -hmm. so did you ever, do you ever like, do you still live with that fear of like somebody coming after you or anything like that? Or? I mean, I'm very cautious. You know, I live by what I preach. Um, for instance, we have a place in downtown Jacksonville and. I will not, you know, even though I have a dog, it's it's a little baby beagle, you know, he's <laughs> not very mean. Um, I will not go out at night um, without my husband going with me or somebody else. And even with my gun, because I just know it, nobody plans on being a victim. It happens in the blink of an eye mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. literally in seconds, yeah. in a second, in yeah. a second. Mm -hmm. And so I am very cautious because i never want to be in that place i was at and even though i'm armed i also know how long it takes to get your gun out and it takes a long time and that one second is already gone past yeah so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well for the sake of time i do want to start asking you about a few cases um i know you have been very involved in moscow you know idaho murders and i just had a few questions um, first of all, do you think the trial will be tele te televised? That's no, helpful. no. I, I mean, this is asking, do I think, do not do I want it to or not want it to, but what do I think will happen? Right. So I think it might be streamed possibly like they're doing now. So now they're doing a delay stream, right? It happens and then only court TV's in there and then they can record it and then it's released to the other outlets. That's the best case scenario anyone can hope for, I think, under this judge. I'll, I'm waiting to hear. I mean, I saw that the last hearing they had, um, he said no cameras. And I know that that was partially because it discussed grand jury, you know, 6E, uh, secret information. Um, but there were other things discussed at that as, as, as well, or that will be discussed at that as well. Um, so... I just think he's leaning toward no. And look at what happened to him his first day on the bench. He He's on the bench and he pronounces two of the names wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. Mm -hmm. It looked terrible. And those victim families were incensed and they thought this judge doesn't even know who these people are. And it's really not that. People, he, he said that he hadn't been feeling well. Judge, judge, which I love that name. I love to just say it. Judge, judge. Judge, judge. Um, so he made an error mm -hmm. and you know, because you're on air a lot. Yeah. And I know because I'm, I mean, sometimes I'm like, why did I say that that way? Mm -hmm. Or, or why did I mispronounce that? Because you don't mean to, and you do. And he did. Uh, and, and then everything that happened, the backlash after that, I think he's thinking, why would I televise this? Imagine all the mistakes and things that are going to oh be made. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think he's leaning toward no. I don't want him to personally because I don't want those victims on the stand seeing cameras and yeah. like, oh, yeah. it's already going to be a nightmare. Totally. And so for me, this is just one of those trials I don't think should be. Yeah. And I think with the level of interest in the case and, and sort of obsession that people have developed with it that, you know, I don't well, think it just... should be on display for everyone and to over pick things apart and to overanalyze, I think it's probably just not helpful. Um, one thing that we had spoken about, um, Dylan Mortensen and, you know, how much, how horrible people have been towards her and skeptical. And what, what are your thoughts on that? I think Dylan is a victim 
she's a victim survivor. Yes. Uh, so I can't imagine the survivor's guilt she has. Oh my God. Um, yeah. That night, I think it will come out that she was probably heavily inebriated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It was four in the morning. So even if you're not inebriated, anyone would be tired after a full day and into four in the morning. Um, and uh, I think there were a lot of factors that went into the decision. And I don't even think it was a decision. I'm going to say a lot of factors that went into the delay of 911 being called. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you my kids in their 20s, when they would come home from college and they went out and got home at two in the morning and then ordered pizza and went to bed at three or four in the morning, I didn't hear a crickets from them till noon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's just a totally different vibe, the college vibe. And, and oh, absolutely. I think people forget. And a lot of people haven't been to college. Mm -hmm. You know, they might not have ever had that experience to really understand that whole dorm and right. college Late house. Nights and, yeah. mm -hmm. and I think, I mean, she gives pretty decent descriptions about what happened preceding that and voices she heard and playing with Murphy and Xana whimpering and, and then looking out for I, the third time and, and seeing this figure, mm -hmm. I, I think. She describes it, and I'm going with her description. She was frozen in fear. Mm -hmm. I get that. Everybody's different. I don't freeze, I flee. But in my classes, I told you we do scenarios. I have seen people, every class, they freeze. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you doing? Do something. Yeah. You know, they don't mean to freeze. It's their, uh, it's their physiological response to fear and to unknown and to everything else going on in their brain at that time. And I really think she froze, didn't even know what to do, shut the door, didn't know whether that person, and I think she just went down in her bed. I think she was inebriated and I think she just shut it all out and passed out. Yeah. That's, that's what I think happened. We're going to find out. I might be mm -hmm. wrong, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I don't think it was I'm not going to go out. Right. You know, I I want them to lay there dead forever. I don't think she had any no, idea what no. had happened. I, I I mean, people have been so critical of her, and like we spoke about earlier, I think it's just people who have never been in a situation like that can't even imagine what that would be like. That are so judgmental and think that oh, if it were me, I would have done this. And it's like, well, you really can't say unless you were actually there and in her shoes during those moments. What do you think? cross-examination will be like for her i think it's going to be horrible i think it's going to i was so glad when bethany i don't know if you remember this but bethany they were going to take her and um have a session with her and have her interviewed and i was so happy that ended up not happening because the grand jury happened um i think it's going to be horrible for both of those survivors and not only them people forget about everyone who came over to that house you know in the time that 911 was called, there were a whole bunch of kids there. Yeah. And what they saw, and all of those kids are going to be on the stand. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, as a person who testified all throughout my career and who still testifies now in my career, testifying is hard. It, it, it is. It looks hard. It's yeah. hard. You're, you're remembering everything. Um, you, you can have notes um, just to keep you on track. And it's not that you're not being honest, you're just trying to make sure you have every detail because guess what? You're doing your best to recall and to give the facts and guess what they're doing? The defense attorneys, they are doing their best to pick you apart, to try to get you to slip up, to try to hear you say, oh, didn't you, didn't you say this? Yeah. When Trip it was really up. this yeah. and, and to make a mountain out of a molehill and uh, it's, it's going to be horrible for them because there's four attorneys for Brian Koberger right now, and they are all very well educated and very well experienced. Four of them going after 20 year old. Well, wow. she'll be a little bit older. She'll probably be 23 by the time she's stay on her 24. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. She's a kid mm -hmm. who's never would have probably ever testified, certainly not in a murder trial. And it's going to be horrible. I feel mm. terrible for them. I do too. It's it's really sad. What do you think about, I know there's been a lot of talk about these IDs that were found mm. in his glove. 
And obviously we don't really know. I don't know if you've heard anything about who these IDs belong to. It sounds like they were maybe women, but not the victims in the case. I mean, is there, do you have any thoughts on that? So the source information came from a News Nation source, I believe. I mean, that's what was reported on News Nation. I was on that show when it was reported. And, um, you know, I commented about it. Oh, my goodness. If he has an ID, if, if the source right. information is true, that relates it all to King Road. And that was the reporting. Not that it was the victims or anything like that, but just somehow related to King Road. That's going to be a smoking ID. In other words, that is going to directly connect him again beyond the DNA, beyond the phone information, beyond the videos. That's going to connect him again to having taken something that's related to that house. So it's very important, Kendall, I think, if it ends up being true. Mm -hmm. But source information is is just that. It's, it's source. It's not fully vetted. Do I think anybody would give information they didn't believe? not on your life. Their reputations are in the balance. Um, but uh, so in answer to your question, extremely important, but it's got to be vetted. Until I see one of those, you know, I classify it for what it is, source information. Okay. Could they be his IDs, like just past IDs of his own? That, the information, as I recall, was connected in some way to King Road. So how I... I guess how I interpreted it personally is meaning that maybe it was an ID of a former person who lived there mm. or something. Mm. I don't even know if it was necessarily taken from the house, but something maybe showing he was looking at that house. I'm not exactly sure. We don't even know whether it was a driver's license, whether it was a credit mm. card. Yeah. Um, so it was very ambiguous, um, but it certainly was believed by that source that brought that information. Interesting. What's your what's your take on the DNA evidence in this case? You feel like so it's strong. feel like it's yeah. it's rock solid. It, this is how I look at it. Okay, the naysayers that want to pick apart this case that, by the way, was one of the most well done cases of any case I've ever seen, been a part of. It was just amazing how quickly they worked to get this guy off the street. Again, he is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, but. They did a remarkable job identifying a suspect. If, if that um, information uh, pertaining to the DNA has already been shown through direct DNA testing, not genealogical, mm -hmm. how else could it have gotten there? Okay, these are the only possibilities. One, he touched a sheath at some sort of sporting goods store and then somebody at that mm. store somehow ended up killing the victims that Brian Koberger just happened to touch. Oh, but by the way, his DNA isn't on it. Okay, there's one idea. The other is that the police planted it. This crime scene was crawling with investigators and crawling with police. Then you would have to believe that this police officer picked out Brian Koberger out of all the people in the world and decided to go mm -hmm. and somehow transfer Brian Koberger's DNA at some point onto the sheath and then hide it under Maddie Mogan, who was lying there dead. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of people out there who believe those types of things? Oh, theories? yeah, they do. They do. Wow. They do. These are the premises that are being put forth. My God. Um, there is no viable, logical explanation and everything is viable. People love to say touch DNA. They don't understand how strong touch DNA is. This was a clasp of a um, knife sheath. And for those of you who have had a K-bar knife or other knives, we had them on our belts with SWAT, uh, not K-bars, but various whatever kind of knife we wanted. But our sheaths were meant to keep that knife in. Right. They're hard to push. Hard to unsnap. Mm-hmm. Um, you do not want to knife your knife coming out no. and you don't want to grab it loose and cut yourself. So this is a difficult to unsnap, which is all it makes all the sense in the world for why the friction caused cells of his to then be lodged on this snap. So this is 
not just like oh yeah just like a oh i was just at the store and i just like ran my finger over it type of thing this is he put pressure onto the sheath and that's why i think you know so lucky somebody was looking out right mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. that probably when he wiped it down you know he would have been handling it with gloves so my belief is this is from all the other times he had snapped it unsnapped it snapped it unsnapped it all these times that he had worked with that not from that night he was gloved that night and then he unsnaps it so how lucky are we if you will that that amount but it it's not really luck because of the friction involved right interesting why would he use a knife he had already had for a while yeah if oh, he's going to be that careful and he's fantasizing yeah i mean these killers don't just especially somebody like him he planned it he did those you know times he went by um way in advance he he was prepared to do this and he had fantasized about it and i think he sat there probably with that k-bar knife or just kind of flipping it open flipping it and imagining yeah. this is how it was gonna play out and interesting and then you know took that knife sheath he just made a big mistake and i know why he did it because if he had it say in a cargo pant you know but not affixed to him it's kind of hard. Just think about it. Sit right there and, and have your knife. And then you're like reaching up like this. He wanted to be quick with it. So the smart thing to do is have it in your hand, undo it, put it in your pocket, and then attack. Mm-hmm. And then that way, you, can, you know. And then when he was leaving, he would have kept it in his hand in case Zana mm-hmm. or Ethan mm-hmm. came, right? I mean, I don't think they were targeted at all. I think they were complete, um, you know, hurt after because he had to like collateral yeah Yeah. (sighs) terrible brian koberger was searching the term brian koberger suspect as early as 2018 what do you make of that right so all those google searches that all that google searching really has me in a in a quandary in a way because I believe that searches like that would have taken place for a reason, perhaps committing other crimes or worried about it. Think about all the times that people Google themselves. Yeah. People wonder if they've done something wrong and they, you know, Google. So I'm not surprised. Um, to me, the whole Google search thing was just very interesting yeah. all the way around. Um, what specifically does it say? I think only Brian Koberger can tell us, but I can tell you that people do it all the time. Really? Is Google themselves. Well, I mean, Googling yourself is one thing, but Googling oh, yes. yourself with the word suspect. Yes. What does that mean? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Googling yourself as suspect specifically to me, me meant was he doing something else illegal? Okay, yeah, that's what I'm I'm curious about. Do you think it's possible he has committed other murders potentially? I don't know. And the reason I say that is I think his DNA would have matched to other killings. But what I do think is he would have done something in the burglary realm. Mm. You know, Non-violent, like breaking, where in, he's breaking in and practicing. Sure. You know, seeing what he could get away with. Um so that I think Hmm. I can see that. Yeah. It's hard to go ahead and just decide to step up to the plate with yeah, the major leagues a, when you've never right. even hit off the tee. Yeah. That's true. That's a good way to put it. And a, and a lot of killers do do that. They do. Mm-hmm. On animals, mm-hmm. they practice in. There's other things that come before just that one, the one night mm-hmm. that you go and do that. And oftentimes, you know, BTK is a good example. Yeah, I was um, going to bring him up too. Yeah. That you uh, go in and, you know, you have all these individuals there and everything goes to heck. Your whole plan goes to heck. And I think that's what happened with Brian Koberger. Your whole thought of seeking revenge against, I still, my view is that was Maddie Mogan was the target. That's just my thought. I base that on the fact that it would be either Maddie or Kaylee and Kaylee had moved away. She came back really on the spur of the moment. And at least from the information we know, and they've done much more research now, 
I haven't seen anything in the probable cause affidavit that shows, uh, you know, he would have known she would have been there. Remember, she had a brand new car. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so did he really know she was going to be there? Was he surveilling right when they were there and coming back? Would he have known she was in the same bed? I think he knew about Maddie more than Kaylee, but I think it was one of those two, certainly. Mm. What do you think about the defense waiving its right to a speedy trial? Why do you think? They had to do that. Um, There's just 52 terabytes, that's right, Yeah. of information. It's just so much. And even though people will say, well, yeah, the 52 terabytes, one terabyte, well, even try to get through one terabyte, but you still have to look at the 52 terabytes if you're doing your job because you might find some nugget that could be exculpatory for your client. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, there's no way they could get that, you know, information looked through sooner and um, they had to waive it. Do you think that law enforcement has the murder weapon? No. No? I think the only person who knows where the murder weapon is and where his, what he wore, all of that, I, I think is Brian Koberger. Yeah. And and who knows where it is at this point? I mean, it could be. Well, he did this very interesting, you know, return route out into the country. And believe me, law enforcement, I'm sure, has searched high and low. Um, but he could have either discarded it into a body of water in some way. He could have buried it. Um, I kind of think he would have buried it. And if he did get away with this some day, you know, go back and just revel in it. Mm-hmm. Um but I think I've always said the only way I think we're going to know about that is, is one, if he decides to cooperate someday, like BTK did, or two, if out of just pure luck, it's found by somebody, some hunter, some mm-hmm. camper, someone just comes upon it, just yeah. luck, you know, like a wash of water comes sure. and if it's bare part of it is un- just, uncovered yeah and yeah. it's possible if someone really does find it that they don't know what it is and they just hang on to it it's so true i'm glad you said that because we in true crime right we know a lot of stuff going on in true crime and yeah. um but your average joe isn't they're not true crimers unless they're newsies and then they might yeah. know a little mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. i i always say i my tennis circle, you know, my circle of, of football friends, um, my college circle of friends, they barely know anything about these cases. Right, right. Um, mm-hmm. I was on the plane the other day, the other day, it's probably been a month now, and uh, somehow the whole Koberger thing came. I heard some people, somebody talking, and somebody was like, oh, was that did somebody get hurt in Arizona or something like that? They had no idea. A lot of people don't know. That's an interesting point. And someone, I mean, I'm sure it happens all the time where people come across evidence. They have no idea. They either throw it out or keep it or whatever. Um, Do you think that Brian Koberger will be found guilty? I think he will. I I think he will be found guilty. You know, um, I think that the evidence is there and strong enough. It'll be interesting to see really what the defense can do once everything is laid out on the table. And in your opinion, what do you think the motive was? I think he was an incel. I think this was a true femicide. Just, Mm -hmm. you know, I think Maddie and Kaylee both sort of stood for something he could never have and something that had caused him a lot of pain in his life. Um, And I think he was also the type of person that was very narcissistic and felt he could get away with it and wanted to show he could get away with it. And uh, so I think that's the motive. Do you think he will be given the death penalty if he is found guilty? I don't think, I'm not sure. It's hard to do these days, it seems like. You know, to get 12 jurors. Yeah, it's gotta be unanimous. To agree. Yeah. I don't know. I think some people will pity him um, for whatever reason, I think. And a lot of people just either from a religious standpoint or from a moral standpoint, they just don't 
agree with the whole life for life. You know, they think that, you know, somebody should get clemency. And, and then other people think, listen, it's worse to be alive in a maximum security prison. Right. So when I think about all of that, I don't know. I'm leaning toward no. Mm, interesting. I know so many people want to see that happen. Um, it's obviously a very heated discussion there, but um, I guess moving on, because we could go into that for a while, but what questions do you still have about the case? Well, of course, I want to know where that knife is, the murder weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to understand if the premise that you know, I believe happened, you know, which would be he had coveralls on or coverall type outfit and then had black, like a tight fitting, you know, uh, outfit underneath and that he disrobed and put it in a plastic bag and then threw it in the trunk or, you know, in the car. And then did he have, um, plastic sheeting or something to protect the car because mm. I think most of us, in fact, I know all of us, at least anybody I had ever spoken to since or before, all of us believed there would be some uh, evidence, not necessarily DNA evidence. And I got a lot of heat over this, something I said, and I want to take it straight on that blood is not DNA. And guess what? Hair isn't DNA. Semen isn't DNA. Saliva isn't DNA. DNA is in blood. But blood, there are parts of blood that have absolutely no DNA in it. Mm. Blood is a substance that contains DNA. Just like your hair right. contains right. other substances. And, you know, I guess I, you know, sometimes I, I maybe don't do a good enough job just getting very specific in what I mean. Um, but everybody keeps saying, you know, there was no DNA in the car, but was there blood in the car? Was there any remnants of blood that didn't, you know, staining that didn't have any DNA? We don't uh, know that answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I always found very interesting in that defense response was they went to great lengths of saying there was no DNA in the car. You know what they didn't say? There was no DNA in the house. Oh, yeah, you're right. Don't you think they would have said mm -hmm. no DNA in the house? Mm -hmm. oh, that's, a, that's a good point. So I've always wondered, was there DNA in the house? Do you think we'll get the answers to some of these questions in trial? We're going to get the answers probably to everything except for, I think, the knife and the bloody clothing. I don't know. I don't believe that's been found, although everybody is under a gag order. So it's possible. Yeah. I just think he probably did a, he really almost did the perfect crime. People say he was stupid. You know, he drove his own car. Well, he would have been really stupid to rent a car. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Really stupid to borrow a car. Really even the most stupid to steal a car. Yeah. So using his own car was the best option. Mm -hmm. Then the whole turning his cell phone off and, and all of that, the ins and outs. Well, you see how he was prepared to explain that. Well, I like to stay out late and drive around. Hmm. So they're going for that. Um, why a knife? Seems oh. like a messy... I, I, I know why, but right. because yeah. of... Ask it. But yeah. it's like, that's the one part that could ultimately cost him with not getting away with with this right and and the mistake of not affixing the sheath right the knife will probably bring him down yeah that sheath mm -hmm. sheath and then plus when you use a knife in so many instances the perpetrator cuts themselves because it's a frenzy oh totally a complete flurry of stabbing and you know Arms holding flailing. them down yeah. Yeah. And you, you can just imagine it and so um, I think you're right. It will be the old, uh, it obviously is the linchpin to this whole case and the whole reason that he's not going to get away with it. But other than that, he really committed a great crime. Question for me is, if the sheath wouldn't have been there, would he have gotten away with it? Would the case have been strong enough with the circumstantial evidence I hate even using the word circumstantial. 
almost every case convicting a reast. Yeah. Uh, it was circumstantial. Bad evidence is direct evidence oftentimes because eyewitnesses see it wrong. They think it's somebody else and whatever. That's much more difficult. If I look outside and there's green grass at eight o'clock at night and I get up in the morning, I look outside at 8 a.m. and it's covered in snow. I know it snowed. I don't need to see that snow come down. It's there. Right. And that's the really how circumstantial evidence works. But I wonder if all the other evidence they have, you know, would have convicted him. And it might because of the Amazon purchase that is circling about, right? Mm -hmm, uh, again, mm -hmm. source information that he purchased that knife from Amazon, period. A and now we're- A bar knife. What? what is K-bar. K-bar. What is, I've never even heard of that. Oh, it's such a great knife. Does that sound weird? <laughs> no. <laughs> when I say it's, it's really a, well, a cool it's a very gun. Well I mean, coming from an FBI agent, I don't think it sounds weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's fixed blade, meaning it's not a switch blade, meaning it's it's all one unit. It has a, a basically a bar here so that when you stab, you don't have to worry about your hand going down. Think about like a steak knife. Oh, Doesn't right. have that. Right. Okay. This has... Like a bar. Oh. Stops your hand from Stop your hand going onto the blade. Because okay. when that you're going down with force, you're going to slide, your hand's going to slide and it's, mm -hmm. you know, everything going on. It's a primary weapon that would be uh, carried by a SWAT team member that could be, would be carried by military where you have to cut very difficult things to cut wiring and, and Metal burlap, even, yeah. you know, very difficult things to cut. So you want something that's super sharp like that. And sturdy. So and you just purchased that off Amazon? Oh, yeah. Do we I, know that's for that's a fact? No, this is what we know. We know. It's funny. I actually did a whole tweet on this because I was so interested in the exact K bars that they were searching for. So dialed down all of those search warrants and ended up, I think, with like six knives that they think would have matched the injuries. I mean, that's why I think they dialed down on these. This was before uh, they knew it was Brian Koberger or they had suspected, or they were just trying to figure out who would have bought this K-Bar knife. And now you see them dialing down, right? Now, now you see these new documents are coming out specifically about purchase information and uh, search information and everything because they want to know what all went into him picking that knife? Did he have three in his cart? <laughs> did he have one? Yeah. Why did he pick this one? I'm wondering if this is going to be, there's K-Bar knives that are smooth mostly, but there's one that has the jagged, jagged edge. edges. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I'm wondering if, if that's going to match the injuries and that's the one he chose. But it's through Dateline. The Dateline show, they have a source that said he purchased it from Amazon. Brian Koberger purchased K bar knife from Amazon. That's mm. wow. deadly information, if true. Mm. And then now, when we see the search warrants coming out, you're like, hmm, it's matching up, I'm just saying. Interesting. When do you estimate the case will go to trial? When do you see it actually happening? Maybe three years. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be a while. Yeah, I said two to three. Now, just seeing delay after delay. I mean, really, somebody was sick. Who was sick? Yeah. Who gets sick the day before? Is yeah, the judge sick? I don't think the judge was sick. Was the, you know, it, and it, the reason I say that, it was a defense motion. Mm. So that tells me, so if, it, if he was sick, he could sit in his cell and watch. Right. There's four attorneys. Yeah. If one attorney's sick, the other three can handle this. So I just see what They're I've just... seen throughout my whole career is defense attorneys will delay as far, they would delay this 10 years if they could. Now, some people say it's terrible. He's sitting in a cell. But the staler these things get, just imagine. I mean, something yeah. could happen to their witnesses. Right. It, the longer it goes on. They hope it weakens the, the weaker the evidence the case. in the case. And, mm -hmm. Wow. And probably emotions of people and look let at, it die down. Look uh, at the, you know, everybody's familiar with Charles Manson. Oh, yeah. And you know, I've gone off on the Leslie Van Houten situation. 
Mm. Leslie Van Houten participated in stabbing the LaBiancas over 40 times and right. smearing their blood on the wall and then sitting out and snacking out of the refrigerator. A, a horrible heinous. All I know, Charlie made him do it, drug-induced, yeah. all of this. What about the LaBiancas? Yeah. They were massacred. Horribly, yeah. And, and she's walking now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's insane. Because why? Everybody's forgotten. Poor Leslie Van Houten. She's turned her life around. Nobody, and then all the victim families, they're almost all gone. All the, vag you know, the yeah. close yeah. people, La Biancas. And that's what I even see happening with this case. People are forgetting all the evidence. They've just totally blowing it off now. And it hasn't even been, been that long no, at all. No. We're talking. Yeah. Coming up on a year. Yeah. yeah. But, but since wow. he was arrested, mm -hmm. You know, 10 months, but. Yep. Yeah, well, he was arrested in what, January? Fifth? December 30th, I believe. Oh, okay, right there, yep. Oh, yep, I remember that. God, time is flying by. Um, We have only a few more minutes. Um, I do have to get home. My nanny has to leave, so I gotta yeah, get back to right. my kid. But I did want to ask you about the Gabby Petito case while I have you mm -hmm. here. Um, I know that you have suggested that maybe Brian Laundry had help committing suicide. Can you explain that theory a little more? <laughs> um, it is bothersome to me when I learned, it was the first thing that jumped off the page to me when I read the autopsy reports. The autopsy report came out, I printed it off, I'm like reading. I, what? He shot himself through the left side mm. and it exited the, wait, wait, he's right-handed. I always yep. remembered it. So I look on there. Autopsy report says he's right-handed. I literally pulled every picture, every video, anything I could find. He does everything right-handed. I saw him holding a peach once with a left hand, but he had something else in his right hand. Like, and, and anyway, a lot of us hold stuff in our left hand, but you don't motion, you don't play a guitar, you don't write if you're right, dominant right-handed. Right we really handed. need control. So there's only a few explanations, right? One ambidextrous. I found no photographic evidence of that. I found no medical evidence of that. In other words, that being written, you know, in the autopsy, looking back at his medical records or his sister said he was right-handed, not that he was ambidextrous. I found nothing to show he was ambidextrous. So to me, that's not an issue or a, a possibility. I guess it's a possibility, but it's not a good possibility. The second one is that <clears throat> he had something in his right hand. In other words, a picture of Gabby and mm. then decided to shoot himself. Oh, yeah. And that could be it. But I would still argue you would put the picture of Gabby in your left hand to make the most important shot of your life because what happens if you miss? Mm -hmm. You're a vegetable. You're yeah. maimed. You no, can't do true. anything. You're a hot mess sitting there. It's literally a very important shot <laughs> yeah and plus he used a revolver and a revolver has an extremely difficult trigger pull compared to an automatic gun that's a light trigger press um compared to that revolver so it's less much more strength you would need and you have much less strength and it's awkward mm -hmm. okay then i combined that with the fact that his parents knew exactly where he was. They opened it back up and boom, his parents were there, went right to the spot. Combine that with the fact that they went and removed his car. You remember when they yep. got yeah. confused whether yep. he was yeah. there or not? Mm -hmm. They went there and took his car. I always said they took his car for one or two reasons. A, he's dead, or B, he's gone. He doesn't need the car anymore. Right. What parent, if you thought you're kid was there camping and hiding would take yeah. would take the car no, that makes no sense none and so that made no sense to me um when you combine that all together oh i forgot one other important piece was the paperwork that was seized where in his diary or note he writes about asking i believe it was two buddies not having it in front of me two buddies something like i thought about asking so and so and so and so to help me kill myself, but I didn't want to get them in trouble. I didn't want them to go to jail. So that made me think, well, 
but would he ask his parents? Then combine that with that crazy burn after reading where she was willing to yep. put a knife in a cake. Yeah. She's going to bring a shovel to bury a body. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit more for <sighs> people who maybe haven't heard this part of the case? Yeah. This, this is a case to me where a mom is basically telling her mom, her son, I am here for you through it. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it certainly looks that way. Killed Gabby. I'm here for you. If you need me to help bear, if, if they catch you and you go to jail, I'll bring a file. He's just, to me, she's just, and she says burn after reading because she doesn't ever want this to be evidence. Yeah. She, if you didn't know, she had wrote a note and actually wrote burn after reading, which tells you a lot right there. Yeah. And I keep wondering how many other notes might there have been that were burned Mm -hmm. after reading. Yep. I'm sure there were more. A lot of times when you, whether you get the dope or you get the child pornography, whatever you get, there was a lot more there that maybe you didn't get. When I combine all that together, it just gives me a lot of pause, whether he truly did it on his own or whether it was an assisted suicide. And assisted suicide happens. It happens often. I have a lot of homicide detective friends that have investigated more murders than me and you know, are so experienced. And one of the most experienced one I know that I'm very close with, I called him right after this. And I said, oh my God, he didn't even know about the case. And I gave him the facts because I, I, I hadn't even gotten the words. He's right-handed and it went left to right. He goes, assisted suicide. No way. And he's seen wow. hundreds of murders in a wow. huge city. How do you think the civil suit will go? I think it's the ruling so far by the judge are definitely every single one has been in favor of the Petito Schmidt families. Um, so it shows me that you know, the judge believes in this case, believes in the evidence, believes in how it's been brought. Mm-hmm. Um, my whole thing is, and they've already been awarded money. I think this is not about the money. As you no. may know, Steve Berlino, who's also in the suit, the lawyer for the Petitos and mm-hmm. Schmitz, mm-hmm. or I mean, sorry, for the laundries, for the laundries. He said, I want to settle. Yeah. He's like, yeah. here, yeah. just Let's work out a number. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't think the Petito and Schmitz want to work out a number. No, mm-hmm. no. They I mean, that's not important to them. Want I don't think. accountability. Yep. They want to sit across that table and hear them say, I knew Gabby was dead and I knew Brian did it. So I think that's what this suit is about. And I know a lot of people say, just leave it alone. I, I mean, I see that all the time on my Twitter feed and I see it in social media. A mm. lot of people are not sympathetic to the parents. It and pisses me off. And me too. Thanks for saying that. It's ridiculous. It's your child. Yeah. Again, it's people who aren't in that situation just making judgments until you're in that situation and you you would be told to just let it go. I mean, come on. Never. And it's some ridiculous. people can. Mm. Maybe Gabby would have, right? Her whole mantra, let it be. True. You know, and maybe, but that doesn't mean the Schmitz and the Petitos want to do that. No. And the judgment that goes on in cyberspace and mm-hmm. oh, the, it's horrible. the slews and everything is, it's really unfathomable to me. It's so judgmental. Me too. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah, we see that all the time. This has been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for coming. Mm-hmm. I really hope you come back and, you know, talk more with us because we had so many other things we wanted to get to. This, I don't know how long we've been going, almost three hours maybe. About I'm a jabberbot. It's gone Sorry. very fast. How long have we been recording, Janelle? Uh, around two and a half. Okay, two okay. and a half. Yeah. Ah, it feels long. like it's been 20 minutes. Like it went quick. You are just so fascinating. Where can people follow you, find you, and keep up with the work you're doing? So I really am only on Twitter, and okay. it's Coffee Daffer FBI. Now, people will say, because I've heard people call me out, wait a minute, you have a TikTok, or wait a minute, you have a Facebook. So I have a Facebook, and it's only for personal friends. Okay. Um, I don't do anything to do with work on there. It's really my personal. And, um, but I have been told and people have been showing me that there are lots of Facebook Jennifer Coffendaffer accounts coming up. No, oh. none of them are me. Okay. I don't even oh, have, no. That's my name isn't even Jennifer Coffendaffer on my Facebook. It's a, it's Coffendaffer. It's Jen Coffendaffer. It's not Jennifer. So all those accounts are not me, not associated, not what I'm writing. I'm glad I got to be able to say that. My TikTok, I had the most wonderful intern 
um, last summer. And she's young and knew everything about social media. And I said, listen, why don't you set up a TikTok for me? So she set it up. And um, I think I recorded like three little things and I sent them yeah. to her and she posted them. And that's been the end of my TikTok. <laughs> other than <laughs> other really hard. people TikToking for me. Yeah. Like they take, take excerpts your clips and, then, and they, mm-hmm. they take it. So, but I'm, yeah, Twitter. talking down for FBI. Yeah, and your Twitter is fascinating. I mean, you're always up to date on everything and on the latest news. So definitely give or her catch her a on follow. News Nation. Yeah, catch her on News Nation. Oh yeah, definitely News Nation. And there's a few documentaries coming out that should be kind of fun. Oh cool. Some of it, the the one I'm really excited about. It's just because it's so different. It's on Netflix. It's not out yet, and it's about gangs, but it's not about a traditional gang. It's about the first gang ever in the United States, oh, and wow. that was uh the um, gang that Wyatt Earp took down mm. back in the 1800s. If you've ever oh, watched the movie, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tombstone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll it, it's just kind of cool. I love cool. the old outlaws and stuff. Yeah, yeah the old outlaws. Yeah. And, and how they really were same in terms of initiation and in terms of what they did to people who, mm-hmm. you know, snitched um, as the gangs now. So it's yeah. just kind of, so you're you're featured on that then? Um, yeah, just as a gang expert, that's one of my areas of expertise. Gangs. Oh, that's going to be so. One cool. of your many areas of expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just been. So that's well-rounded. because I'm old. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> Twenty eight years in law enforcement is a lot of time. That well, is a lot of time, it's, but it's super impressive, and it's. I mean, you have so many stories. I'd love to have you back on and get into more. Of yeah, that. we didn't even and get into like remotely yeah, the we had so much questions um that i've got but we are going to be you know continuing to work together and collaborating i yes, hope we I'm can so excited yes i have a case coming up in the next couple of weeks for my channel that you might be able to you know give some some statements for and i really liked working with you on the Corey richens case as well so thank you so very much thank yes you. thank you really thank appreciate both you. of you for having yeah. me of Thanks course, a lot. of course, it's been it a pleasure. A great discussion. Um, yeah, let us know your thoughts on yes. YouTube down in the comments. We'd love mm-hmm. to hear. Mm-hmm. I mean, we covered a lot of different things, and we'll also put chapters in our description box yeah. so you can kind of skip around and go to the parts that you want to what you want to hear. Hopefully, you watch it all. But I know it's a long, uh, long episode. But yeah, and if you're listening, uh, be sure to check us out on Instagram and give us your feedback there. We'd love to hear from you there as well. But that is going to be it it. for us Thanks again, Jennifer. We'll be back next week. But until then, keep on taking your mind a mile higher.